Imagine you and some of your best buddies are traveling by plane to what you think will be a weekend to remember. Suddenly, you experience some bad turbulence, but it's nothing you haven't felt before. Then it gets worse. The plane drops through the sky, luggage falls from above. You grab hold of the seat arm, your knuckles whiten as you do so. The next thing you know, you're freezing cold, still fastened to your chair, in a part of the plane that broke off. You crash into the earth, but miraculously, you're still alive. You don't know it yet, but you've landed in one of the most unforgiving environments known to man. There's nothing but mountains around you. No vegetation, no animals, nothing. You are at least alive, but soon you'll be hungry. It won't be long now until your friend tells you, I'm going to eat the pilot. As unbelievable as this sounds, it's exactly what happened. This is the survivor's story that eclipses all others. It's the tale of heroism and sadness, a brutal story, and one we just can't imagine being a part of. Let us start from the beginning. It's October 12, 1972, a Thursday. Friends who play on the same rugby team from Montevideo, Uruguay, are on their way to a match in Chile. There are 45 of them on board the plane. Not only the young, strong, and fit players, but some of the team's family members as well as some supporters and five crew members. It's expensive to fly commercially to Chile, so they opted for the cheapest option, which in this case was chartering an Air Force plane. What they don't know is that this American-made Fairchild FH-227D has the nickname the Lead Sled, owing to its high weight and relatively weak engines. They'll also soon find out why it has such an atrocious safety record. All they know now is it's the cheapest way to fly over the Andes mountain range to play what will be a fun game of rugby in Santiago. That first part of the trip is cut short due to a terrible storm over the Andes, and they're forced to stop over in Mendoza, Argentina. There's a direct route to get them to Santiago from there, but the plane can't fly the 25,000 to 26,000 feet required to get over the mountains. Instead, they'll take a route that looks like a U-turn. This route will skip the highest peaks and instead find a way around them. It's now Friday the 13th and they set off again. The atmosphere is fun. The rugby ball is being thrown around the plane. It's all laughter and games. One of the players, Nando Parado, gives his window seat up for his friend so his buddy can get a better look at the mountains. Nando has no idea that this small gesture will end up saving his life. Not long after, the turbulence starts. At first, no one takes it seriously, but then someone points out that the mountains seem to be very close to the plane, like right outside. What they don't know is the pilot and co-pilot have made a terrible mistake. They told air traffic controllers that they would reach the airport in a minute. They couldn't see much due to the clouds, and they were wrong about that minute. They were actually 11 minutes away. They were still in the mountains and hadn't reached the safe spot where they could turn right toward the airport. They descended anyway and were hit by more turbulence as they were right in the middle of mountains where the winds were chaotic. The plane was thrown around, the clouds parted, and the pilots saw a black ridge directly ahead of them. The plane attempted to pull up and accelerate and now the passengers knew they were in trouble. The aircraft hit the ridge, tearing off the rear of the plane and sending the plane hurtling forward. They are still about 13,800 feet above sea level when they likely collided with another mountain causing the wings to come off and leaving just the front part of the fuselage. Those at the back of the plane have been thrown out into the mountain range. Some are alive in the plane, but there is no time to think. Suddenly, what's left of the plane hits a snow-covered mountain. The fact that even this much of the plane survived is incredible, but what's even more incredible is what happens next. The plane begins sliding down the mountain like a sled, but somehow doesn't collide with any rocky outcrops or boulders, sliding down and down the mountain until finally, it comes to a stop at 11,710 feet above sea level. Seats have been uprooted and bodies have been bashed against the front of the pilot's cabin. People are strewn everywhere, but many of the passengers have somehow survived. Some are screaming, their limbs twisted, parts of the plane stuck into them. But they are surrounded by glaciers so remote they don't even have a name. No one goes there and there's little hope of being found. It's freezing cold and it's hard to breathe because the air is so thin at this altitude. Of the survivors, those that are least injured begin to help the less fortunate. Some have broken bones, some are almost dead from internal injuries. Nando is in a coma and will remain in one for three days. Of the 45 passengers aboard the plane, 12 of them died immediately when the plane hit the mountain or fell out the back of the destroyed aircraft. Some bodies are found still strapped to their chairs covered in snow and not far from the crash site. The first night is brutally cold, with temperatures getting as low as negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit. The survivors huddle into the fuselage and try to block up the holes with suitcases. They all mistakenly think that a rescue operation will find them, and this will be their only night on the mountain. 
They could not be more wrong. What they don't realize is that the plane's white coloring means it cannot be seen from the air. Five more people die from their injuries on that first night. Nando in his coma doesn't know that his mother is dead and his sister is dying. Both were only on the flight because Nando was told he could use the empty seats for free. Inviting them would turn out to be the biggest regret of his life. The next day, the injured are attended to, some still screaming because their legs and arms have been broken in many places. The pilot is dead. The co-pilot, who made the terrible mistake, is found crushed under debris but alive. He tells the survivors that he has a handgun and asks them to shoot him and put an end to his pain. They don't kill him, but he dies soon after. But now they need food. At high altitudes and such cold temperatures, the body burns calories extremely fast in an attempt to stay warm. All of the luggage is searched, and while there is an endless stock of cigarettes and lots of booze, there isn't much food. In total, there are eight chocolate bars, a tin of mussels, three jars of jam, a tin of almonds, and some candy and a few bottles of wine. The survivors immediately make a rationing plan. It's next to nothing for so many people, and they have no idea how long it needs to last them. They have water at the very least, being able to melt it and funnel into empty wine bottles. Days pass and more die. On the tenth day, Nando, who's now conscious, holds his sister as she dies in his arms. He would later say that he went to sleep and woke up in hell. And yet, it will get worse, because they then heard on a transistor radio they had found in the wreckage that the search for them was being called off. They knew they were alone, cold, and starving. It was at this point of extreme desperation that Nando had told a friend, I'm going to eat the pilot. In fact, a few of the survivors had been rolling the same idea over in their minds. One of them later told the media, our common goal was to survive, but what we lacked was food. We had long since run out of the meager pickings we'd found on the plane, and there was no vegetation or animal life to be found. After just a few days, we were feeling the sensation of our own bodies consuming themselves just to remain alive. They didn't see it as cannibalism. If they were to survive and see their families again, it was what they had to do. There was no choice, eat your buddies or die. There were 27 people still alive at this point, which is a lot of mouths to feed. They started with the pilots, stripping the bodies of all the possible meat, including the organs as their starving brains told them, eat more, eat everything, don't waste a bit. On day 17, disaster struck again. In the middle of the night, they heard a noise, what one of them later described as sounding like wild horses running at them. It was an avalanche. Snow burst through the hole in the plane, and the entire fuselage was packed tight. Those alive scrambled to dig for air and find their friends. Eight more died, and the rest were in the dark, buried in snow, with little air to breathe for three days. In time, the snow would melt, and the fuselage would again be sitting on top of the snow. The days passed and they survived by eating more of the dead. They smoked cigarettes and went out on little exploratory missions, but after just a few hundred meters, they'd be too tired. The snow was too deep and the air too thin for their weakened state. They were also affected by snow blindness, essentially a sunburning of the eyes that comes from the sun reflecting off the snow. To fight back against their surroundings, they made makeshift snowshoes and sunglasses so they could stray farther. Even then, they were surrounded on all sides by dangerous crevasses. One of the survivors would later say, We felt like insects trapped in the hugest forces of nature. They were right. There's almost no place on Earth where it would be harder for humans to survive. On one sojourn, they found the other part of the fuselage. Inside were batteries for the plane radio, as well as some chocolate, a little candy, and comic books. They stayed there all night, reading the comics by the light of the fire they had built. For a while, they had hoped that they could use the batteries, but it soon became apparent that hooking up a radio with lots of wires was not something any of them possessed the know-how to do. As Nando later said, we were very depressed. For him, the only option now was to walk right out of the mountains. They were aware that Chile was west and remembered that the pilot had said they weren't far away from their destination, but they had no way of knowing that they were still 37 miles from the nearest road. But that wouldn't be an easy hike. It was 37 miles of glaciers and rough terrain, and they were far from experienced outdoorsmen. But Nando knew they had to walk over the mountain range to Chile. It was their only option. They decided that they would stock up on human meat and only the strongest would go. Nando and two others named Roberto Canessa and Antonio Bicentin. On day 61, when the men set off, only 16 survivors remained alive. Some were sick and everyone was malnourished and beaten by the elements. Before they left, a man named Carlitos Peas made them a sleeping bag with parts of the aircraft insulation sewn together with copper wire. Had they not had that, they would have surely frozen to death on their hike to freedom. It took them three days to climb the first mountain. 
Nando expected to see green valleys from the top of that mountain, but what he saw instead were more mountain ranges. Byzantine turned back and gave his food to the others. Nando and Canessa both said, we'll die, but we'll die trying. They didn't die. They walked for days, almost passing out from exhaustion. But on day 8 of their walk, they found a river. They saw green poking through the melting snow, and most importantly, they saw a person on the other side of the river. Though they were unable to cross to the other side to meet him, they slept there that night and the next morning the man came back. He had brought with him a piece of paper and a pen. He tied them to a rock and threw it across the river. Nando wrote on the paper, We are survivors of the plane crash. We have no food. We cannot walk anymore. There are more of us in the mountain. Where are we? And threw it back. The man went to find help, himself being many hours by horseback from civilization. On day 10, Nando and Canessa were finally picked up by the army, their skinny bodies carried out on the back of horses. Nando said at that point he was ready to embrace life again. Soon, helicopters would take Nando to find his friends, with the pilots asking how they could have possibly walked over such terrain without equipment. It was amazing. Their journey was tracked by professionals years later, and even with the latest equipment they found it hard and very, very dangerous. On day 71, the first of the team was picked up and on day 72, the rest were taken. All were suffering from various ailments, but all of those who had still been alive eventually recovered. And in fact, only one of them is not alive today. Once the newspapers had stopped cheering for the survivors, many began to ask just how they had survived so long without food. It was impossible, literally impossible. Then, a photograph taken by the rescuers came to light of a human carcass whose bones had been stripped. The survivors admitted what they had done, and many in the public turned on them, calling them cannibal savages. Nando later said that eating human flesh wasn't an easy decision, it was a last resort. He said, we tried to eat strips of leather torn from pieces of luggage, though we knew that the chemicals they'd been treated with would do us more harm than good. We ripped open seat cushions hoping to find straw, but found only inedible upholstery foam. It was either feast on dead friends or die, and one survivor that was reluctant to turn to cannibalism actually did die. But 16 of the survivors decided that they would do whatever it took to stay alive, and because of it, they made it down off the mountain. It's raining men. Hallelujah, it's raining men. Amen. So goes the famous 1982 hit by the Weather Girls, It's Raining Men. Yet for a woman in London on the 30th of June of this year, it was literally raining men, or rather a single man who fell to his death and landed in the garden of a London suburbanite. The woman had been calmly sunbathing when suddenly the body of a man landed with a crash just one meter away. Upon investigation, a bag, some water, and other personal effects were discovered, and it was believed that the man had stowed away in the landing gear of a Kenyan Airways flight inbound to Heathrow Airport. Astonishingly, this was not the first time that such an incident has occurred, and people falling to their deaths from the landing gear wells of aircraft is a not so uncommon occurrence throughout history. On February 22, 1970, a 14 year old boy fell to his death just shortly after takeoff. From an attempt to stow away in the landing well of a Douglas DC 8 flying from Sydney to Tokyo, an amateur photographer astonishingly happened to capture the event just as it happened, and the boy began his fall. International flights are notoriously expensive, at least those outside of Europe, where budget airlines such as Ryanair let you literally take your life into your own hands for the cheap cost of an average taxi fare. Yet, despite the dangers, many people routinely attempt to stow away aboard an aircraft. And while most attempt to gain access to the cargo compartments or even inside the aircraft itself, in lavatories or maintenance areas, more desperate souls routinely attempt to stow away inside the wheel well of the aircraft. Of 113 verified attempts to stow away in the wheel well of an aircraft, between 1947 and 2015, 86 of these people died, giving would-be stowaways a dismal success rate of 24%. These incidents are rarely investigated, but it's believed that most of the stowaways died from being crushed by the actual landing wheels. In most aircraft, there's very little room left after the massive wheels are retracted, and to make matters worse, there's no light inside the well itself. As the wheels start to move upwards, it can be difficult to understand how the legs connected to the wheels will fold up into themselves, and this can be fatal. Consider it a particularly difficult game of Twister, only instead of embarrassing yourself in front of your friends, your life is at stake. Putting an arm or a leg in the wrong place can lead to it being mercilessly crushed by the metal legs of the wheels, or trying to squeeze into what seems like a safe corner can lead to you being smashed to bits by the giant rubber tires themselves. The whole time you're also trying to not fall out of the aircraft 
which is already moving well over 150 miles per hour, with a hurricane force wind trying to pry you loose. Needless to say, it's no easy task, and it makes us respect the few who survived the ordeal all the more. The second leading cause of death appears to be freezing to death, which should come as no surprise. The wheel wells are not climate controlled and are definitely not airtight. As the plane rises in altitude, the air gets colder and colder until eventually the temperature can hit as low as negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit. Because stowaways are trying to squeeze into a very tight space, they can't afford to bring lots of warm clothing to put on and fight the effects of the cold, and often are forced to simply huddle in the cold dark alone, trying to warm themselves with their own body heat. To make matters worse, as the plane rises in altitude, the air also gets thinner, which makes it even more difficult to breathe. The lack of oxygen can lead to hypoxia or the body not getting enough oxygen to survive. If you've watched our previous video on the man who survived being frozen for 12 hours though, you'll know that extremely cold temperatures can actually work to help keep a person alive. The extreme cold will slow down the body's core processes, which in turn drastically reduces the amount of oxygen needed to survive. Thus, the lack of air alone is usually not fatal. Another problem facing stowaways though is the fact that the very low atmospheric pressure of high altitude flight is well below the threshold needed to maintain consciousness. This means that stowaways will go unconscious not long after the plane hits its cruising altitude. While again this can help keep a person alive in extreme cold and oxygen deprived environments, the real problems of consciousness begin when it's time for the plane to land. As the plane descends to land and the wheel well is warmed and atmospheric pressure is restored, which can begin to wake up an unconscious stowaway. Yet, if the stowaway isn't fully alert by the time the plane comes in for the final approach, typically only taking a few minutes from initial descent, then the landing gear will drop and the unconscious or semi-conscious stowaway will plummet to their death. Even if the stowaway manages to not be crushed to death as the wheels retract, and then endures freezing cold temperatures for hours at a time, and manages to regain consciousness right before the plane lands, there's two more major problems to overcome. The first is a condition common to deep sea divers known as the bends. Because the wheel wells are not pressurized, nitrogen gas bubbles begin to form in the bloodstream and the fluids inside the body's tissues. Normally, to combat the bends, divers will slowly bring themselves back to the surface, spending time at different depths to slowly dissolve the nitrogen that's formed in their bodies. For a stowaway whose jet is descending at several thousand feet a minute, this isn't an option. The nitrogen bubbles begin to burst all at once, causing extreme pain and sometimes even being fatal. Next time you pop open a can of soda, imagine that happening inside of your body. The pain can be excruciating and it makes clinging on to wheels as the plane descends that much more difficult. Yet if the stowaway manages to avoid the bends, then they also have the task of actually clinging on to the aircraft itself as it descends with the wheels lowered. Airplane landings are basically nothing more than controlled crashes, and because metal is heavy, it tends to fall out of the sky at very high speeds. A commercial jet airliner typically comes in for a landing at anywhere between 150 to 166 miles per hour, which is enough speed that the plane is still generating some lift with its wings and can land relatively smoothly. Because after much research, into the issue major airliners discovered that passengers tend to dislike when their plane lands nose first on the ground. It also runs up operating costs as each flight necessitates a brand new aircraft and aircrew both. For a stowaway clinging on for dear life, this is equivalent to trying to hang on to the face of a category 5 hurricane, all the while being jostled as the aircraft is buffeted by turbulence during final approach. Needless to say, some stowaways are unable to keep a grip and fall to their death. Despite all the dangers though, people continue to attempt to stow away at the wheel wells of aircraft, as they're much easier to access than the cargo compartments that are often locked up. One 12-year-old child from Indonesia actually survived a several hundred mile trip in the wheel well of a Douglas DC-3 aircraft way back in 1946. Granted, DC-3s had a flight ceiling of around 20,000 feet, so this particular stowaway didn't have to deal with many of the dangers that modern stowaways have to when flying at 39,000 or more feet. This 12-year-old Indonesian child would go on to be naturalized in Australia and live out a happy life. Unfortunately, a Soviet teenage stowaway two decades later would be crushed to death as he attempted to flee the Soviet Union in a flight from Moscow to Paris. Another 13-year-old stowaway from France died when the landing gear of his aircraft was lowered on final approach and he fell to his death. Like with so many who died this way, it's believed that he hadn't fully regained consciousness yet. A migrant worker in 1995, however, froze to death on a flight to Shanghai and his body fell when the plane was on final approach to the airport, giving a rather rude surprise to whoever was directly below. 
Tragically, in August of 1996, two young Mongolian boys aged 9 and 12 both died after attempting to stow away in the wheel well of a U.S. Air Force Lockheed C-141. The 12-year-old was discovered crushed to death by the service crew after the plane landed, and the 9-year-old would die of his injuries two days later in a U.S. military hospital. A similar story with a 50% happier ending occurred later that same year, when two Indian men stowed away on a flight from New Delhi to London. One of them survived the 10-hour flight in the nose wheel at 35,000 feet, but his younger brother died when he froze to death. Tragically, the two brothers had paid an informant for knowledge on how to access the baggage hold of a Boeing 747 from the wheel well, but upon sneaking into the wheel well, they discovered that there was no such access. Though the surviving brother applied for political asylum after the landing, he was denied and sent back to India on the first flight after leaving the hospital, presumably not in the wheel well this time. Another man from Burkina Faso failed to hold on to his aircraft's wheels as the plane came in for a landing and plummeted to his death just before landing. Most disturbing of all, though, is the death of an unknown stowaway who was crushed to death in the wheel well of a Boeing 767 and actually caused a landing gear failure. The plane was forced to conduct an emergency landing when the wheels wouldn't fully retract. Though unknown to crew, this was because the stowaway's mangled body was preventing them from doing so. Upon lowering the wheels for landing, body parts fell on a busy traffic intersection in a town of Saudi Arabia. Not all stowaway attempts end tragically, though, and the world's first aerial stowaway is credited to 19-year-old Clarence Terhun who in 1928 stowed away on a German Zeppelin flying from New Jersey in the US to Friedrichshafen, Germany. He made a bet with his brother-in-law that he could beat all previous stowaways by hitching an illegal ride aboard the German Zeppelin and revealed himself to the crew above the Atlantic Ocean. He was made to work in the kitchen for the remainder of the flight and arrested after landing, though the German people considered him something of a hero and sent him telegrams, dinner invitations, and even job offers. Terrifyingly, the American Federal Aviation Administration openly admits that the full list of stowaways who die attempting to hide in the wheel wells of aircraft is unknown, and current estimates are incomplete. The FAA says that due to so many airports being near the ocean, an unknown number of stowaways have surely fallen to their death into the sea as their plane came in for a landing. This leaves the real number of people who have died in the wheel wells of aircraft unknown, though it's clear that only extreme desperation could possibly drive a man or woman to do such a thing. Next time you fly, consider that while you're enjoying the in-flight movie and a complimentary packet of peanuts, a stranger may be dying just a few feet away in the wheel well of your aircraft. When the chips are down, how do you respond? All of us like to think that we can rise to emergency challenges, but hope to never have a moment where the extreme end of our ability is tested. Unfortunately, during what should have been a routine flight, the crew of United Airlines Flight 232 was suddenly faced with an unimaginable disaster, a scenario considered so improbable there was no formal procedure for addressing it. This is the tragic yet miraculous tale of the crash of UA Flight 232 and how the flight crew rose to the challenge and attempted to do their very best under the circumstances. On Wednesday, July 19, 1989, UA Flight 232 took off at 2.09 p.m. Central Time from Stapleton International Airport in Denver, Colorado. The McDonnell Douglas DC-10 jet airliner was bound for O'Hare International Airport in Chicago with continuing service to Philadelphia International Airport. The liftoff was picture perfect, the sky was bright, cloudless blue. Soon the plane was cruising at an altitude of 37,000 feet, with the autopilot engaged. In the cockpit was veteran pilot Captain Al Haynes with two experienced co-pilots, First Officer William Records and Second Officer Dudley Dvorak. It was a full flight with 296 souls aboard. In addition to the three pilots, there were eight flight attendants and 285 passengers. Due to a Children's Day promotion where children could fly for one cent with the purchase of a regular adult ticket, there was an unusually high number of children on the flight, 52 to be exact. Four of these children were lap children or children under two years old and per American flight regulations could be held in the parents' arms with no seats of their own for the duration of the flight. The first half of the two-hour flight was uneventful. Then at 3.16 p.m., while the plane was making a right turn over Iowa, there was a loud bang in the rear. An explosion jolted the plane, causing it to shudder violently. Immediately, several freaked out passengers wondered if a bomb had gone off. On the flight deck, the pilots were bombarded with warning alarms and flashing lights. The autopilot disengaged and officer records took control of his steering column. The flight instruments indicated that engine number two on the tail had malfunctioned. So Captain Haynes and Officer Dvorak rapidly shut it down, which stopped the plane shaking. 
Luckily, DC-10s are equipped with three engines. Engine number one is mounted in the front of the left wing, engine number two is in tail, and engine number three is mounted in the front of the right wing. The plane could still fly with only two engines working. Captain Haynes hastily made a reassuring announcement over the PA that engine number two had some problems and as a result, they might be a few minutes late to O'Hare. However, as this was happening, the plane suddenly swerved hard to the right, began to roll over, the nose diving. Officer Records turned his steering column trying to straighten out the plane, but it wouldn't respond to his commands. Captain Haynes also tried turning his steering column, but the plane still wouldn't respond. Officer Dvorak quickly realized that the gauges registering fluids for all three hydraulic systems were displaying zeros. The plane had lost all hydraulic fluid, therefore losing all conventional flight controls. The hydraulic systems on the plane control vital functions such as steering and manipulation of the flaps, ailerons, rudders, and braking systems. The DC-10's three hydraulic systems are fully independent of each other and are designed to be redundant in case of an emergency, meaning that the plane could fly with just one of the hydraulic systems working. For all three hydraulic systems to fail on a DC-10, it's a billion to one chance. In just seconds after the explosion, the plane was more or less simply sailing through the sky on an unmanageable trajectory much like a thrown paper airplane. A single question dominated Captain Haynes' thoughts. How do we keep this plane in the sky? Thankfully, the number one and number three engines on each wing appeared to be working properly. To level out the tilted plane, Captain Haynes decided to use the throttles to manipulate the remaining engines. He throttled back the power of the left engine to idle and increases the power to the maximum on the right engine. This caused the plane to yaw left and the air to flow slightly faster over the right wing, generating more lift and forcing the wing down which leveled out the plane. In the cabin, passengers were panicking. Chief Flight Attendant Jan Brown and the rest of the flight staff have been attempting to keep things as calm as possible. Captain Haynes calls Brown to the deck and informed her of the situation. Back in the cabin, she thought calling a meeting with the flight attendants would scare passengers, so she surreptitiously alerted them one by one as she passed them in the aisle. As it just so happened, seated in first class was Denny Fitch, a United Airlines pilot instructor. Despite crew reassurances, he knew there was something very wrong. He let the flight attendants know his job and stated that he'd be happy to help the flight crew. At 3.29 p.m., about 15 minutes after the explosion and the loss of controls, Captain Fitch joined the flight crew in the cockpit. They explained the issue and have him go look out a cabin window to check if the ailerons are moving when they attempt to steer them. They're not. Captain Haynes has Captain Fitch take over control of the throttle for the two working engines. He maintains a white-knuckled grip on the throttle for the rest of the flight, while Captain Haynes and Officer Records continue to manipulate the steering columns in the hopes that they can control the plane. Meanwhile, Officer Dvorak has been communicating with air traffic control, the UA maintenance base in San Francisco, McDonnell Douglas, the maker of the plane, basically anyone they could get a hold of. It's considered virtually impossible that all three hydraulic systems would fail on a DC-10 and there's no emergency procedure to deal with the crisis. Furthermore, no one has any real suggestions on what to do. The pilots of UA Flight 232 are on their own. Captain Haynes realizes the best course of action is to make an emergency landing as soon as possible. They decide on the small regional airport of Sioux City some 65 miles away. Captain Haynes informs senior flight attendant Brown and makes an announcement over the PA, telling passengers to prepare for a crash landing. In addition to the plane constantly skewing right and trying to roll over, the plane's doing what's called in aviation a fugoid cycle. Basically, it's acting like a ship going over heavy waves. It pitches and climbs, then pitches down and descends, while speeding up and slowing down as it goes downhill and uphill. With each iteration of the cycle, the aircraft loses approximately 1,500 feet of altitude. In the cabin, Brown and the other flight attendants go row by row checking seatbelts, making sure that all passengers know what to do. Per United Airlines rules, the parents of lap children are told to place the babies on the floor and when bending in the brace for impact position, hold them in place. In the cockpit, the four pilots worriedly discuss whether to try to use the landing gear or land the plane on its belly. Landing gear is controlled by hydraulics, however, on a DC-10, when the landing gear doors are open, gravity will make the landing gear fall out and lock into place. Also, there's a lever for activating the landing gear which also unlocks the outboard ailerons. They hope that when the landing gear is in place, some residual hydraulic fluid will flow back into the proper system and they'll be able to steer the plane. On the other hand, the pilots have been managing to keep the plane in the air through throttle usage. Trying to utilize the landing gear could cause a whole new set of problems. 
At around 3.49, some 30 minutes after the initial explosion, the pilots use the lever to open the landing gear doors. Luckily, the landing gear drops, locks into place, and doesn't cause other issues. The landing gear actually somewhat increases the stability of the flight, although it doesn't push any trapped hydraulic fluid to the controls. Meanwhile, in Sioux City, the airport's been preparing for a crash landing with ambulances, fire trucks, and volunteers. Fortuitously, two Sioux City hospitals, one of them a regional burn center, are in the midst of a shift change. This means more people are available to treat survivors. For the last 20 minutes or so, Flight 232 has been flying towards Sioux City Airport in wide, awkward loops, trying to dump as much fuel as they can to make the plane, which weighed some 3,600,000 pounds, including passengers and luggage, lighter before attempting to land. The plan is to land on runway number 31, which at 9,000 feet long is the longest runway at the airport. But Flight 232 comes out of a turn lined up with closed runway number 22, which unfortunately is where all the emergency services vehicles have been parked. Worried about keeping the plane in the air, they decide not to make another approach and warn air traffic control that they'd land on the shorter 6,600-foot runway number 22. Just minutes before the plane touches down, emergency services scramble to move their vehicles. Flight 232 would be landing at a high rate of speed. With a loss of hydraulics, the flaps couldn't be extended, which meant flight crew would be unable to control both the airspeed and sink rate. Another huge problem is that hydraulics also control the braking system for the plane. At the edge of runway 22 was a cornfield. They hoped that as the plane touched down, it could roll into the cornfield and that would help slow it. On the final descent, Flight 232 is going 220 knots and falling out of the sky at 1,850 feet per minute, approximately 400 kilometers an hour forward and 34 kilometers an hour downward speed. This is over twice the speed of a normal safe landing. In the cockpit, alarms sound for the ground proximity warning. The cabin is utterly silent as the flight attendants shout for passengers to brace for landing. At 4 p.m., the right wing of the wobbling plane struck the ground, spilling 10,000 pounds of kerosene and bursting into flame on impact. The clang of steel hitting the runway reverberated through the cabin as the plane bounced and skidded forward. The plane broke into three main pieces as it careened down the runway and skidded into the cornfield. The cockpit went one way, the tail another, and the main center of the aircraft slid sideways, rolled over onto its back, and came to a stop upside down in the cornfield. Passengers are tossed about, some still strapped in their seats. Due to a ruptured fuel tank, a huge orange fireball rolls through the cabin. Survivors help each other out of the burning plane as first responders rush to the chaotic scene. It took rescuers almost 30 minutes to identify the debris that was the remains of the cockpit. It had burrowed into the ground due to force. It took a forklift and cutting equipment to free the four alive but injured pilots. Captain Haynes was knocked out upon impact. He had a severe concussion and received 90 stitches. The wreck of Flight 232 burned for two hours. 34 ambulances and nine helicopters transported the injured. Of the 296 people on board, 111 died, while 185, or 62.5% of the passengers, survived. 125 passengers suffered only minor injuries, and 13 actually walked away unharmed. 11 children, including one lap child, died. 35 passengers survived the crash, only to pass away of smoke inhalation while trying to escape from the wreckage. Only a single crew member died, flight attendant Rene LeBeau. The tragedy was the fifth deadliest crash involving the DC-10. A long and complex investigation by the National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB, eventually revealed the cause of the tragedy. An infinitesimal flaw was created when the titanium fan disc for the plane tail engine was manufactured due to impurities in the metal melting process. Over 18 years of plane usage, stress on the flaw in the fan disc caused it to form a crack. Slowly, the crack grew larger and larger, and on Flight 232, at 3.16 p.m., the fan disc fractured, causing engine number two to explosively disintegrate. In a stroke of pure bad luck, shrapnel perforated the lines to all three hydraulic systems which ran through the horizontal stabilizer in the tail, causing them to leak all the hydraulic fluid. Though the plane had undergone regular maintenance, the crack in the fan disc wasn't noted, although it had eventually grown big enough to be seen with the naked eye. Despite the loss of life, Flight 232 is held up as a model of CRM or crew resource management and studied in flight school. The number of deaths could have been far greater. Both the cockpit and flight attendant crews communicated well with one another and tried to keep cool under pressure. Though Captain Haynes was in charge, he actively listened to his co-pilots. In addition to expertise, cooperation and teamwork played a vital role in troubleshooting the unfolding problem and landing the plane. 
Once recuperated and cleared of any blame, the four pilots returned to work for United Airlines. In May of 2012, Captain Denny Fitch lost his battle with brain cancer. Captain Haynes flew for United Airlines for 35 years until his retirement in 1991. He also became a public speaker on aviation safety. Captain Al Haynes passed away in August of 2019 at the age of 87. Haunted by guilt over the death of Evan Sow, the lap child killed during the crash, senior flight attendant Jan Brown began lobbying Congress and the FAA to introduce child safety seats on board planes across the USA. Even after retiring in 1998, Jan Brown has continued her campaign. Unfortunately, despite some industry support, to this day airlines in the United States are still not required to provide infants under the age of two traveling as lap children with any forms of restraint. As a result of the crash, the manufacturing process for making titanium fan disks for planes was improved. Also, new aircraft designs have incorporated hydraulic fuses to insulate a punctured section to prevent total loss of hydraulic fluid. Though many people called Captain Haynes a hero, he didn't consider himself to be one. He praised his co-workers, saying he felt that they all simply just tried to do the best they could. The year is 1944, and on a distant French battlefield, a column of Nazi tanks are making their way to a beleaguered American position. The German Panzer and Tiger tanks are amongst the best the world has ever seen, and heavily protected from the front and sides. American Sherman tanks often see their shells bounce harmlessly off the thick front armor and have trouble landing damaging strikes against even the side plates. However, from up top, the tanks are incredibly vulnerable. The American outpost the German armored column is moving toward is under heavy attack and on the verge of being overrun. The US troops are attempting a fighting withdrawal, but this new column of tanks and tracked infantry fighting vehicles spells doom for the beleaguered soldiers. Then, suddenly, there's the rapidly growing sound of diving aircraft. Confused, the Americans look up. They've been calling for air support for hours, but there's simply none available in the area. As the diving aircraft grows in size, the men are even more confused. It's an L-4 Grasshopper a light, unarmed aircraft used exclusively for aerial reconnaissance. The Germans, however, are keenly aware of what this airplane is, and more specifically of the madman who pilots it and what he's able to do. Desperate machine gunners atop the tanks and infantry fighting vehicles fire up at the diving plane, and despite the hail of gunfire, the plane keeps coming. Then, just a few hundred meters from becoming a smoking crater on the ground, there's a rapid series of popping sounds as two bazookas jerry-rigged to the wings of the aircraft fire. The anti-armor rounds hit home on two of the tanks, easily penetrating the thin top armor and knocking them out of commission. As the small grasshopper pulls up, it begins to bank, ready to make another attack run. It still has four more bazookas left to fire. In a panic, the German tanks scatter, giving the Americans the opportunity to withdraw safely. Two years earlier, 29-year-old high school teacher Charles Carpenter couldn't have been further from a feared combat ace. Mild-mannered and well-educated, Carpenter was well-liked by his community and had a job teaching history at the local high school. However, when war came for the United States in 1942, Charles immediately volunteered for military service. Thanks to his education, Carpenter was commissioned as a second lieutenant after going through boot camp and a shortened version of officer candidate school. Then, due to his intelligence and calm demeanor, Carpenter was chosen to be a pilot, and the ever-eager Carpenter happily accepted. Unfortunately, though, Carpenter was assigned to be a spotter for Army artillery, meaning he would be learning to fly the L-4 Grasshopper in the Stinson L-5 Sentinel. These aircraft were incredibly light and carried no armament, designed to instead be fast, agile, and able to loiter over a battlefield for a long time so as to serve as a spotter for friendly artillery. With an aircraft in the area radioing back firing directions, artillery was many times deadlier than without, and despite being initially disappointed that he wouldn't be flying a fighter, Carpenter accepted his equally important if less glamorous job. Disappointment, it seemed, would follow Carpenter, though as after finishing his flight schooling, Carpenter was stuck training others in the US and left out of the war until getting orders to head for France in 1944. Taking advantage of his many flight hours in the US, though, Carpenter had mastered the handling of both the Grasshopper and the Sentinel, a skill which would come very handy soon. In France, Carpenter was assigned to the 1st Bombardment Division under the command of Major General R. B. Williams. Many he met routinely underestimated Carpenter, who very much gave off the vibe of a calm and collected history teacher. Surely someone very out of place from the chaotic battlefields of Western Europe. Then Carpenter got a chance to prove himself in combat when he was assigned temporarily as an artillery liaison to a ground unit. Despite being a pilot, Carpenter was well versed in the techniques for calling in artillery fire, as well as the different types of fire support available to the US Army. His unit responsibility was to move ahead of a friendly line. 
and scout out locations that could be turned into suitable landing strips for friendly aircraft. During the scouting mission, Carpenter's unit stumbled across an understrength unit of infantry pinned down by heavy enemy fire coming from a nearby village. The German soldiers spotted Carpenter's unit approaching and immediately set up a blocking force. The tactical picture was simple and deadly clear to all. If Carpenter's unit didn't break through this blocking force and engage the enemy in the town ahead, the pinned down infantry would be killed to a man. The tank platoon commander in command of the unit's tanks hesitated, however. Their job was to act as scouts and not become decisively engaged, and taking tanks into an enemy-held town without proper infantry support to cover them was very dangerous. That's when Carpenter acted, however, unable to watch the pinned down infantrymen die from a distance. Much to the shock of the tank's crew, Carpenter rushed to one of the lead tanks and hopped atop the turret, grabbing the butterfly trigger on the 50 caliber machine gun mounted there and letting loose on the enemy ahead of them, roaring like a man Madman Carpenter screamed out, let's go, and the rallying cry immediately set the men in the tanks to action. Surprised by the zealous charge of the tanks, the Germans holding the town beat a hasty retreat. When the fighting stopped, however, Carpenter was arrested by military police on behalf of the tank commander. Carpenter was not even in the unit's chain of command, as he'd been attached temporarily to act as a liaison, and then he had completely usurped that chain of command he wasn't even a part of to boot. Threatened with court-martial, General Patton himself dismissed the charges, proudly exclaiming that Carpenter was exactly the type of man he wanted in his third army. It seemed, however, that Carpenter's brief stint in ground combat left him with a deep frustration when flying air recon missions overhead in his unarmed aircraft, watching German tanks and armored troop transports rumble by below and unable to do anything about it was too great a frustration to bear, and Carpenter got an idea. By now, the rumor mill spoke of pilots who had experimented with attaching bazookas to their aircraft and using them to attack tanks from above. Firing a rocket-propelled explosive penetrator, the M1A1 bazooka had an effective range of between 250 and 300 yards. Against the thick front armor of a German tank, the bazooka was useless, and American infantry had to wait to take shots at the sides or ideally the rear of a German tank. A dangerous prospect, it was still better than being completely helpless against these lumbering behemoths. Carpenter immediately attached two bazookas to the wings of his grasshopper, and then rigged an electric switch he could toggle from the cockpit that would fire them. Carpenter's airplane was soon nicknamed Rosie the Rocketeer, and it would be a well-earned name. He soon scored his first kill against a German armored car, diving down from the sky and getting a direct hit with a single bazooka shot. Not long after, Carpenter was hunting for German tanks, and shortly after his first kill on an armored car, he got his first panzer kill. From the sky, the bazooka could easily penetrate the very thin top armor of even a King Tiger tank, one of the most feared tanks of World War II. To do so, though, Carpenter had to dive down onto his target it until he was only a hundred meters or so above it, as he had no way of aiming his bazookas and had to ensure an accurate hit. This daredevil maneuver saw him then pulling several G's as he immediately yanked back on the throttle in order to avoid smashing his airplane into the ground below. At first, Carpenter was ignored by German infantry and the vehicles below. The sight of a small artillery spotter plane was a familiar one to the Germans, and opening fire on one was generally a bad idea, as it would give their position away and invite the pilot to call in an artillery strike on them. This let Carpenter earn kill after kill, blasting apart armored cars, tanks, and even groups of infantry with his bazookas. Soon though, the Germans grew wise to Carpenter, and upon spotting his small plane, would light it up with all the firepower they had. Despite flying into virtual walls of lead, Carpenter refused to give up his attacks, and he continued to rack up enemy kills. His original two bazookas grew to six, and soon other pilots were hearing of his successes and trying the tactic out for themselves. However, the extreme flying maneuvers required and the sheer amount of return fire the pilots faced quickly discouraged many from the suicidal act. Carpenter's greatest deed, though, would come late in 1944 when the Germans launched a blistering counterattack against the 4th Armored Division. Caught completely off guard, the Germans advanced deep enough into the lines of the 4th Armored that they now threatened the unit's battlefield HQ. If they could take the HQ, it would throw the entire division's defense into disarray, leading to the destruction or capture of hundreds of men. Carpenter immediately took to the air, his trusty grasshopper fitted with six bazooka tubes ready to fire. Unfortunately, thick ground fog prevented Carpenter from getting a visual on the fight below, and so he decided to loiter around until the fog cleared up. By noon, the fog had finally lifted enough for Carpenter to see what was going on down below, and that's when he spotted a column of APCs and tanks heading to reinforce the attack on the division's HQ. Carpenter immediately put his plane into a dive and lined up with the two leading personnel carriers, taking them out with his bazookas and getting the attention of the Germans below. 
The Germans broke formation as they tried to evade the aerial attack, buying enough time for the Americans to redeploy to face this new threat. Flying back to rearm twice, Carpenter launched deadly strafing attack after strafing attack on the German unit, allowing the 4th Division's HQ section to successfully retreat. Carpenter would go on to fly his grasshopper with reckless abandon throughout the war. Thanks to the very light construction and the plane's incredible lift capacity, unless an enemy round managed to hit the cockpit, the fuel tank, or the engine directly, the small plane could take a major beating and keep on flying. Often Carpenter would return back to base with his fuselage and wings full of bullet holes, only to patch them up and to be back up in the skies the next day. Sometimes though, Carpenter wasn't satisfied playing his part of the war in the skies, and once he strafed a column of German tanks, he then landed on a field next to them, picking up a discarded German rifle and taking six of them prisoner. By war's end, Carpenter was known to all as the Mad Major, and though he was only officially credited with six tanks destroyed or disabled, his unofficial record was much higher. Carpenter, however, fell seriously ill in 1945, effectively ending his participation in the Second World War. It was discovered that he had Hodgkin's disease, and though doctors only gave him two years to live, Carpenter once more defied the odds. He returned back to the States and to his role as a quiet, unassuming high school history teacher, where he would remain until his death in 1966 to cancer. Rarely speaking about his part in the war, Carpenter taught hundreds of young students who no doubt had little clue that they were being taught by one of the bravest and most insane pilots of all time. The pilot takes a deep breath and prays. He sights his target and banks hard to the left. The engine roars under the strain of gravity. The target is lined up. The pilot pushes down on the flight stick. The plane dives toward the ocean below. Wedged in between the metal ring of the tachometer is a picture of the Emperor of Japan. Clutched tightly in the pilot's hand is a piece of cloth with his family's name embroidered on it. A feeling of calm washes over him as the battleship gets closer and closer and closer. Less than a year prior, the Japanese soldier sits in a large barracks with a bunch of his comrades. They're playing cards and smoking cigarettes. A veil of smoke fills the air as the soldiers enjoy some downtime after a campaign on a small island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The soldier has fought in several battles for the Emperor. His duty is to defend Japan against the Allied threat. He wears a freshly wrapped bandage around his shoulder where an enemy bullet lodged itself in the last battle. A high-ranking officer enters the barracks. All of the men immediately stand at attention. The commander walks up to the Japanese soldier and hands him a plain white envelope. In it is a folded piece of paper. The soldier takes out the paper and reads it. It's a letter directly from the Emperor. The letter asks the question, will you serve your country as a kamikaze pilot and bring glory to Japan? Below these words are three options, volunteer willingly, volunteer, or no. However, there is really only one option that any soldier can choose, unless he wants to bring dishonor upon himself and his family. The soldier checks the volunteer willingly box and hands the envelope back to the officer. The other soldiers congratulate him as he's about to make a great sacrifice for his country. He'll be a hero. The soldier packs his possessions into his standard issue tan sack and follows the officer out of the barracks. He's put on a transport to be taken to the closest air base where he'll be trained by the Japanese Air Force. The entire trip, the soldier thinks about what lies ahead. He thinks about the honor that being a kamikaze pilot will bring to his family, the sadness of not seeing his mother again, the pain of being engulfed in a fiery explosion. But to die for one's emperor is a privilege. The newly recruited kamikaze pilot reaches the air base where he'll be trained. He stands in a row of soldiers with the same determined look on their faces. He wonders if this is just a facade or does every one of these kamikaze pilots believe in doing the will of the emperor for the glory of Japan, even if it costs their lives. The soldiers stand at attention. The commanding officer announces that they're about to be in the presence of greatness. It'll be a privilege that so many others in the country only dream of. They're about to meet the emperor. Emperor Hirohito rides down the dirt road on a white horse toward the newly recruited kamikaze pilots. The sun reflects off of his medals and sword. The horse gallops in a steady cadence reminiscent of the beats of a war drum. Hirohito stops just in front of the line of men. The soldiers look upon the emperor, their eyes wide, trying to keep their resolve even though they're filled with admiration and awe. Emperor Hirohito tells the kamikaze pilots that it is their duty to bring honor to Japan. He's requesting their service personally. This is a special request because the emperor is the embodiment of the country. He is practically a deity. Hirohito leaves and the soldiers are left with their thoughts. They're put through training and tests to teach them basics for flying a plane before the more technical training begins. 
The soldier has learned from talking to the other kamikaze recruits that, like him, many of the kamikaze pilots went to Japan's best universities before the war. The emperor isn't just sacrificing the lower classes to the war machine. Instead, some of the most intelligent people in the country are being put into planes loaded with explosives in order to give their lives for Japan. The soldier sits in a classroom with old wooden desks and chairs. The officer at the front of the room teaches lessons around suppressing fear and other troublesome emotions. The soldier is to maintain a clear head and do his duty. That's it. There's no need to worry or be nervous because this is the kamikaze pilot's destiny. There's nothing more important than serving the nation. The officer explains that even if the soldier were to die, it's for a worthy cause and will be the ultimate fulfillment of duty. The lesson ends with the officer commanding the kamikaze pilots in the room to carry out their mission or do not return. The soldier wonders if by some miracle he were to survive the mission, what should he do next? His commanding officer just gave him the order not to return, so if he survives, can he go home? Weeks of training go by and the soldier is no longer considered recruit. He's now a kamikaze pilot and will be given his final mission soon. Before his final flight across the Pacific Ocean, the kamikaze pilot is asked to write a letter to his parents. It'll be delivered when his mission is completed. He sits silently looking down at the blank piece of paper. He takes a deep breath and writes seven words that will be delivered to his mother and father upon his death. I have brought honor to our family. The kamikaze pilot folds the piece of paper and places it inside the envelope. On the way out of the barracks, he hands it to his commanding officer. He looks out across the airfield. The tarmac radiates heat. The smell of gasoline fills the air. Mechanics work on engines as soldiers help mount the explosives to the kamikaze planes. The roar of engines is deafening. The airfield is a conglomerate of older plane models. These previously retired planes are now used for one thing, getting loaded with extra fuel and explosives and flown into the side of allied targets. The kamikaze pilot walks toward his aircraft. It's an old fighter plane with a rusty propeller and chipped paint across the fuselage. He runs his hand along the wing thinking about how this will be the last time he stands on the ground of his homeland. Soon he'll be in the air, and then sent to whatever comes after this life. The pilot grabs onto the warm metal railing of the ladder leading to the cockpit. He climbs halfway up and turns his head to watch his comrades running to their aircrafts and preparing to take off for their final mission. He feels a sense of duty, but also a pain in his heart that he'll never be able to have a family of his own. He releases a sigh and continues to climb. The kamikaze pilot swings his legs over the side of the cockpit and slides into his seat. The flight stick is a little wobbly and the glass on several of the dials is cracked. This plane must have been retired years ago, maybe even before the war had started. He slides the canopy over his head, enclosing himself in the cockpit. The canopy glass has become murky from oxidation in time. The kamikaze pilot looks out at the airfield one last time. He pulls out the choke and signals to the mechanics to start the engine. They pull down hard on the propeller nothing happens. The pilot cranes his neck to look at the mechanic. He reaches up, grabs the propeller, and pulls down again with all his strength. The engine roars to life. The propeller turns for a few seconds, and then the engine dies. Could this be a sign, he thinks? He's heard stories of kamikaze pilots being ready to carry out their missions, but the planes wouldn't start. The older modeled aircrafts were stripped to their bones so they could be loaded with more explosives, but very little work was put into maintaining the plane's engines or machinery. The kamikaze pilot sits in the cockpit. He's filled with a mix of emotions. On the one hand, if the plane doesn't start, he'll get to spend more time in the land that he loves. On the other, he'll not be doing his duty to that very country. It's an internal struggle that many kamikaze pilots have to deal with. Another mechanic runs over to the plane with a wrench in his hand. The two mechanics begin frantically working on the engine. The pilot watches as plane after plane takes off from the runway and flies over the dark blue waters of the Pacific. Suddenly, there's a deafening bang. Smoke bellows out of the engine. The propeller begins to turn. It turns faster and faster. The engine hums to life, and the pilot pulls back on the throttle. The engine's making a gurgling sound, and every minute or so spews out black smoke. But the mechanics give the pilot a thumbs up and remove the parking blocks from the tires. He's ready to go. The plane moves toward the runway. He waits for the signal. When it's given, he pushes the throttle to full. The engine roars. Smoke pours out of the exhaust pipes. The plane lurches forward, pushing the pilot back against his seat. He pulls back on the flight stick and the plane rises into the air. He moves toward his squadron and glides into place. They are now airborne and flying toward their target. The fleet of ships they're going to intercept is not too far off the coast of Japan. The time to contact is only a couple of hours. About halfway into the flight, the pilot watches as several of the planes in the squadron run into mechanical problems and plummet into the depths of the ocean. Eventually, the fleet appears on the horizon. 
They're battleships, destroyers, and an aircraft carrier. They look like little toys in an endless bathtub. The pilot grips the flight stick tighter. This is it. This is what he's been trained for, and this is what the Emperor demands. He'll finish his mission and bring honor to his family and country. The squadron of planes begins to descend. There are bright flashes of light coming from the fleet of ships. The sky is filled with explosions from anti-aircraft shells. The planes dodge and weave around fiery shrapnel and clouds of smoke. The kamikaze pilots are almost directly above their targets. Planes begin taking off from the aircraft carrier to try and intercept as many of the kamikaze aircraft as possible. The Allied forces are well aware of the kamikaze tactic by now. The more desperate Japan becomes, the more dangerous the war gets. They've been planning and putting countermeasures into place. However, if a single kamikaze pilot makes it to its target, the damage can be immense. The pilot pushes his flight stick forward. The plane goes into a nosedive. He looks to his left and sees one of the other planes blown from the sky by an anti-aircraft shell. He looks to the right and sees a missile that's been deployed from one of the larger aircrafts. He knows that inside this missile is a man and a ton of explosives. The pilot has been crammed inside the missile with no means of getting out, since the device was mounted to the plane back at the airbase. The kamikaze missile will free fall for as long as possible, then at the last moment the pilot will engage the thrusters of the missile and he'll maneuver it to his target. The missile is slender and smaller than an aircraft, therefore it's much harder to destroy. The pilot turns his head to look straight through the cockpit windshield. He takes a deep breath and closes his eyes. The battleship he's flying toward gets closer and closer and closer. During World War II, Japanese kamikaze pilots were revered as heroes by their country and deemed an enormous threat by the United States military. These pilots were willing to give up their own lives to serve their country. The word kamikaze means divine wind. We know about how kamikaze missions were used by the Japanese in battles like Pearl Harbor or at naval installations in the Pacific from survivors of such attacks. We also know about the kamikaze pilot experience from individuals who encountered mechanical issues with their planes and were unable to complete their missions. By the end of World War II, almost 4,000 Japanese pilots died in kamikaze missions. It's still disputed how effective these missions were in terms of damage to Allied ships and bases. Kamikaze missions continued all the way up until the end of the war when Emperor Hirohito announced Japan was surrendering on August 15, 1945. Over the years, the Japanese people have viewed the kamikaze pilots with mixed feelings. Some saw them as heroes who were doing their duty during a time of war. Others saw their acts of suicide as shameful. Either way, the life of a kamikaze pilot must have been a difficult struggle between giving up one's life and doing their duty for the glory of the country. This was an internal battle waged within each kamikaze pilot during World War II. The date is June 27, 1976, and an Air France Airbus is taking off from Athens, Greece, en route to Paris. Aboard the flight are 248 passengers, most of them are Israelis, along with 12 aircrew. Amongst the passengers, however, are two Palestinian and two German terrorists. And shortly after takeoff, the three men and one woman reveal concealed weapons and threaten to murder passengers if the flight is not immediately diverted. The aircrew radios their situation to the ground authorities and changes heading for Benghazi, Libya, where the plane lands and is refueled. Seven hours later, the plane departs and finally lands in Entebbe Airport in Uganda. Outside the plane's windows, the hostages see scores of Ugandan troops and are briefly relieved, believing themselves about to be rescued. Yet, as the plane's doors open up, an Ugandan army colonel strides up the emergency stairs and shakes hands with one of the terrorists. The Ugandans are not here to liberate the hostages, they're here to protect the terrorists. Soon after, one of the hijackers contacts international media with their demands. They want a ransom of $5 million for the release of the airplane, along with the release of 53 Palestinian and pro-Palestinian militants from prisons around the world. If their demands are not met, they will begin executing hostages on July 1st. Back in Israel, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin phones US President Gerald Ford, asking him to contact the Egyptian government and request their aid in negotiating with Ugandan President Idi Amin. Egypt, not particularly friendly to the Israeli situation, promises to do what it can. Meanwhile, the Israeli cabinet furiously argues back and forth on whether they should give in to terrorist demands or not and prepares to release the 40 Palestinian prisoners that they are holding. The US and Britain, however, are adamant that they will not negotiate with terrorists and inform Israel that they will under no circumstances release any of their prisoners. The American and British stance is a harsh one, but a logical one. If these terrorists and their demands are surrendered to, then it will only encourage further terrorism. Meanwhile, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat 
attempts to negotiate with Amim, but makes no headway. He then turns to the Palestinian Liberation Organization and surprisingly gets Yasser Arafat to send his political aid to Uganda to negotiate with the hostage takers, though the hijackers refuse to see him. A political situation is quickly becoming untenable, but the Israeli government asks the hijackers for another week in order to buy themselves more time. President Amin, who has been in contact with an Israeli Defense Force officer whom he had a long personal history with, agrees to negotiate with the terrorists after he is told that Israel is preparing to release their prisoners. The hijackers release 48 non-Israeli hostages on the 30th of June, and after agreeing to a deadline extension, release another 100 non-Israelis, all of which are flown to Paris. This leaves 84 Israeli hostages, 10 French hostages, and the air crew of 12 who had refused to leave with the earlier released hostages. With their extra time, the Israeli government breaks into furious discussions on how to proceed, with many wanting to agree with the hijackers' demands in order to gain a release of the rest of the hostages. Yet others, mostly those from the intelligence and military community, refute the idea, warning that this will only encourage further terrorism. With the pressure mounting and the US, Britain and now France adamant that they will not negotiate with terrorists, a final decision is made. There will be no negotiation. Instead, the Israeli Defense Forces will mount a rescue, leading to one of the most incredible military operations in history. With only a week left before the noon deadline of July 4th set by the hijackers, IDF commanders convene an emergency meeting to determine a strategy for the rescue. One idea is to have naval commandos airdropped into Lake Victoria, which borders the Entebbe International Airport where the hostages are kept. Dropped into the lake, the commandos would inflate rubber boats and ride them to the airport, where they would engage and kill the hijackers, and then hold their position and ask President Amin for safe passage home. The plan is almost immediately shot down. For one, the Israelis are told that the lake is infested with Nile crocodiles, and there are serious concerns about Ugandan President Amim's support for any rescue operation. Rather than allow the rescuers to fly home, he might order an attack on the Israeli forces instead, which would lead to a slaughter. The Israelis have two major problems to overcome in devising a realistic rescue attempt. First, they need more solid intelligence on the airport and its layout. And secondly, they must get the assistance of an East African nation for the raid, as the Israeli military lacks the capability to refuel four to six military aircraft so far away from Israeli airspace. The Americans have a huge airborne refueling fleet, but in order to get their tankers on station to support the Israelis, they too would need the permission of several African nations to fly through their airspace, and such a plan risks tipping off a meme to a pending rescue attempt. Instead, the Jewish owner of a hotel chain in Kenya, along with other prominent members of the Jewish and Israeli community in that nation, all pressure Kenyan President Jomo Kenyatta to support the IDF raid, thus securing Kenyan permission for the IDF task force to cross into their airspace and refuel at what is today Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. Further, Kenyan Minister of Agriculture Bruce McKenzie persuades President Kenyatta to allow Mossad agents into the nation so they can collect information across the border in Uganda on the Entebbe airport. Within 24 hours, Israeli Mossad agents have crossed the border into Uganda en route to scout out the airport and its defenses. Other Mossad agents, meanwhile, have flown to Paris, where they're conducting interviews with the released hostages. One of them, a French Jewish passenger with a military background, has an extraordinary memory and is able to provide information not just on the airport, but on the hijackers and the number and types of weapons they carry. All this information is relayed back to the IDF, who have also contacted the Israeli construction company, which had actually built the exact terminal where the hostages are being kept years ago. Building a miniature replica of the terminal, the Israelis begin to piece together where the hostages may be being kept and prepare their strike force. The plan is risky, but simple. Four C-130s would take off from Israel and head to Uganda with a strike force of 100 commandos who would assault the airport terminal, secure the airport against any Ugandan military forces responding to the attack while the planes refueled, and then fly everyone home. The men are split into three elements. Ground Command and Control consists of a small group, including the Ground Commander, Brigadier General Dan Shamron, and support and communications personnel. The assault element consists of a 29-man assault force, led by Lieutenant Colonel Yonatan Netanyahu, and made up entirely of commandos from the elite Sayeret Matkal unit. 
They will be the spearhead of the assault and are tasked with breaching the terminal and rescuing the hostages. The security element is the largest element and is made up of three parts. A force of paratroopers will secure the airport field, clear and secure the runways, and protect the aircraft while they're fueling. The Golani force will secure the C-130 tasked with rescuing the hostages and board them, while also acting as general reserves and reinforcing where needed. The Sayeret Metkal force will clear the military airstrip nearby and destroy a squadron of MiG fighter jets on the ground to prevent any possible interceptions by the Ugandan Air Force. They will also repel any attack by Ugandan military forces responding from the nearby city of Entebbe. The plan is set and with time nearly running out late in the evening of July 3rd, just hours before the July 4th deadline, the strike force loads into their waiting C-130s. The four-plane flight takes off and flies over the Red Sea at a height of no more than 100 feet. From their windows, the soldiers could see waves breaking below them as the airplanes roar along at almost 400 miles an hour. The strike force is flying low and fast to avoid radar detection by the Egyptians, Sudanese, and the Saudi Arabians, fearing that if they are detected, the mission may be given away. Plus, there is the added concern that any one of these nations, not currently on friendly terms with Israel, may decide to intercept the flight. The Israelis, after all, did not gain permission to penetrate or approach their airspace. While flying at 30 meters lets the Israelis avoid ground-based radar, if any military aircraft happened to be in the sky, they would be very quickly detected by airborne radar, and so far out of range of Israeli jets, there would be no hope of protecting the strike force from hostile attack. Nervously, the pilots keep an iron grip on their control sticks. At such low altitudes, the smallest mistake will send them plummeting into the ocean, just a hundred feet below them, disintegrating the massive planes on impact. Trailing behind the strike force's C-130s are a flight of two Boeing 707s, civilian transports that have been retrofitted with medical facilities and a command post for the commander of the operation, General Yakutiel Adam. Hours later, the planes have landed at Jomo Kenyatta International Airport in Nairobi, Kenya. One of the 707s, the medical support plane, is left behind, while the other five planes are refueled and take off for the assault on Entebbe International Airport. On approach to the airport, the remaining 707 circles overhead, allowing General Adam to remain in contact with his forces on the ground. At 2300 hours, the four C-130s all make a combat landing on the airport's runway, their cargo bay doors already open and ready to discharge the men inside. In the darkness though, the first plane almost taxis straight into a ditch, but the other three land without incident. From one of the C-130s, a black Mercedes made to look like President Amin's personal vehicle rolls out followed by two Land Rovers, all bearing the insignia of the Ugandan president. Inside each vehicle are Israeli commandos, hoping to be able to roll past two known security checkpoints. However, as the vehicles approach, one of the sentries orders the cars to stop. He knows that Amin has recently purchased a white Mercedes and is suspicious. As the vehicle rolls to a stop, Lt. Col. Netanyahu orders the commandos inside to shoot the sentries. The commandos fire two shots at the sentries using their silenced pistols and roll away. Yet as one of the Land Rovers approaches, they realize the sentries are still alive. Orders are clear, there can be no sentries left alive who may raise the alarm. The last Land Rover pulls to a halt, and an Israeli commando hops out, killing the two sentries. Upon hearing the gunshot from the commando's unsilenced rifle, the assault force fears that they've been given away, and the vehicles roar to the airport terminal at high speed. Meanwhile, armored personnel carriers are being hurriedly unloaded from the other C-130 planes. One force of armored vehicles hurries to the main entrance of the airport to set up a defensive position should Ugandan military forces respond from the city. The other immediately roars to the adjacent military airfield and begins to rake the 11 Ugandan MiGs with cannon fire. Ugandan pilots rush out from their barracks in a panic, but upon seeing their planes being destroyed by heavy cannon fire, flee from the airfield. In moments, all that remains of the MiGs are smoking wrecks riddled with heavy caliber machine gun fire. On the flight line, the security element has fanned out around the C-130s as the planes begin to refuel from onboard fuel tanks. The mood is tense and suddenly gunfire is heard from the direction of the airport control tower as the Gulani force comes under fire from Ugandan army forces. Back inside the terminal, the commandos burst into the building. One of the soldiers uses a bullhorn and screams in both English and Hebrew, stay down, stay down, we are Israeli soldiers. Unfortunately, a 19-year-old boy stands up in the confusion and is immediately cut down by the commandos, who believes that he is one of the hijackers. Another hostage is also fatally wounded by the commandos in the confusion. 
but the rest dive to the floor and keep their heads down. One of the hijackers, the German Wilfried Bose, rushes into the hall holding the hostages and brandishes his AK at them, but a moment later seems to have a change of heart. Instead of firing at them, he orders the hostages to seek shelter in the bathroom, then turns and starts firing at the commandos. In moments, he is cut down by Israeli gunfire. One of the commandos asks the hostages where the rest of the hijackers are, and the hostages all point at a door inside the terminal's main hall. The commandos quickly form an assault team lining up on either side of the door and toss in three hand grenades. As soon as the grenades explode, the commandos burst through the doors to discover the wounded and stunned hijackers who are immediately shot dead. With the building secure, the commandos rush the hostages to the exit and hurry them along to a waiting C-130. Outside though, the Gulani force is under assault by a platoon of Ugandan soldiers, most of which have holed themselves up in the airport control tower. From their vantage point, the Ugandan soldiers begin to fire down at the hostages as they're being loaded into their C-130, but the Israeli armored vehicles respond with their automatic cannons. Cannon fire blasts the concrete structure, eliminating many of the Ugandans hiding within, but return fire wounds five of the commandos and kills the assault element's commander, Lieutenant Colonel Yonatan Netanyahu. In response, the Israelis fire a rocket-propelled grenade into the tower and strafe it with machine gun fire, effectively silencing any opposition within. Loading the rest of the hostages and Netanyahu's body onto the plane, the assault force is quickly in the air. The entire operation has lasted only 53 minutes, with the assault itself only lasting 30 minutes. Seven hijackers, 33 to 45 Ugandan soldiers, and 11 Ugandan MiGs have been lost to the Israeli commandos, and only three hostages have been killed with 10 wounded. The C-130s fly to Nairobi and link up with the waiting medical plane, which immediately begins to treat the wounded as it climbs into the sky and heads for home. In the aftermath of the raid, Israel faced international condemnation from many states, with a resolution raised in the UN by Benin, Libya, and Tanzania condemning Israel for what it called provocative actions, though it was not put to a vote. The Ugandan and Israeli representatives were summoned before the UN Security Council after a complaint was filed by the chairman of the Organization of African Unity, charging Israel with an act of aggression. The Ugandan foreign minister claimed that the hostage situation was nearing a peaceful diplomatic resolution, while the Israeli ambassador charged Uganda with being fully complicit in the hijacking. In the end, a general resolution condemning international terrorism and calling for stronger civil air security without condemning Israel's actions was raised, but failed to pass in the General Assembly. Most Western nations would go on to praise the Israeli raid, with representatives of the UK and the USA congratulating Israel on an impossible operation. Uganda's President Thamim, however, was furious and threatened direct military action against Kenya for their support of the operation. In response, the US dispatched the supercarrier USS Ranger and her escorts to the Indian Ocean and based it off the Kenyan coast, ready to respond if Uganda followed through with its threats. While he did not take direct military action against Kenya, Amin did order the murder of one of the hostages who had been left behind, Dora Block, a 74-year-old Israeli woman who had been taken to the hospital after choking on a chicken bone. Ugandan military officers showed up at her hospital room and dragged her out of her bed before fatally shooting her, along with several Ugandan doctors and nurses who tried to intervene. Amin would also go on to order the killing of hundreds of Kenyans living in Uganda in retaliation, with as many as 245 Kenyans killed by July 11 and 3,000 fleeing the nation as refugees. Imagine this, you spent a week sightseeing in New York City, but the time has come to return home. Filled with memories of Times Square, Central Park, and the Statue of Liberty, you start to make your way back to the airport. So far today though, things haven't exactly gone to plan. It's been freezing cold all day and everything is delayed because of the terrible weather. After battling through the chilling 19 degree temperature, you got to the airport a half an hour early, only to find out that your plane had been delayed. Typical, it seems like everyone is in the same boat, so the airport is full of people making angry phone calls, having petty arguments with their family or walking around looking disgruntled. When it's finally time to board, the plane is completely full. You end up in the middle seat. The guy on your left has a strange smell, and there's a baby behind you who's already starting to cry. At least it's only a two-hour journey, you think to yourself. So you put on your earphones to block out the noise of the crying infant and pray you'll manage to get a little shut eye. When the flight attendant passes, you hide your earphones with your hair so she doesn't make you listen to the safety briefing instead of Britney Spears. You've heard it all before, and everyone knows it's safer to ride a plane than a car, right? So you look out the window, partly to distract yourself from that guy on your left, and partly to catch your last glimpse of the Big Apple. 
With the soothing sound of Brittany filling your ears, you start to drift into a restful slumber as the plane climbs higher. You watch as the skyscrapers of New York start to look like a model village and the Hudson River becomes a tiny ribbon. What a view! You even see a flock of geese fly past. Weird, you think to yourself. Come to think of it, I've never seen birds from inside an airplane before. But then, before you know it, the breathtaking view is replaced by fire, smoke, and a load of black stuff coming out of what looks like the engine. There's a loud boom as if there's been an explosion, and the whole plane starts to shudder and shake. What's going on? Did something just happen to the engine? It couldn't have been the birds, right? Believe it or not, this really happened to the unlucky passengers who boarded the US Airways Flight 1549 back in January 2009. Just 90 seconds after the flight took off from New York's LaGuardia Airport, the plane met with a flock of Canada geese, some of which were sucked into the plane's engine. When a bird hits a plane in the air, it's known as a bird strike. This could involve birds hitting the forward-facing engines of the vehicle, like the wings or the nose, but the most common place the bird hits is the engine. If this happens, the bird will fall victim to jet engine ingestion when the unsuspecting creature is sucked in and swallowed by the machine. It's not a pretty sight. As a passenger, you're unlikely to see what's happening if a bird does get ingested. It happens very quickly, so even if you're sitting at a window seat near the engine, all you'll see is a blur of motion. Sometimes that's it, and nothing much will happen. In extreme cases, like this US Airways flight, you might see flames, smoke, and blackness from the window. This happens because of a compressor stall. The engine continues going at first, but the compressor stops being able to control the airflow as it should, meaning the engine can't keep itself cool. Just like when you stall your car, this leads to a lack of engine thrust and vibrations. The worst case scenario, there will be bangs, explosions, and the engine will stop working altogether. As well as potentially causing a compressor stall, big birds can disrupt the rotary motion of the fan blades inside the engine, bending or fracturing them. It might sound far-fetched, but according to the Huffington Post, bird strikes are the number one threat to planes worldwide. So, you're sitting in your seat wondering what's happening. As you're watching the flames and smoke around the engine, the plane starts to shake violently and you hear loud bangs. But you're still here and the plane is still moving. Everything must be fine, right? Maybe it was just one of the engines that went down. Then before you know it, everything goes quiet, like deadly silence, the kind you're only used to hearing in a library or exam hall. Nobody is screaming or shouting, they're all just whispering to each other and looking to the flight attendants for some kind of instruction. And the next thing you know, you realize the plane is going down and not up. You look out the window again, hoping to see some kind of runway, instead you realize the plane is heading for none other than the Hudson River. And then there's the sound that you never thought you'd hear. The sound of the captain rings out. Brace for impact. Most planes have two to four engines. If one goes out of action, the pilot will return to the airport as a precautionary measure. But the plane can still function. In fact, most aircraft can cross half an ocean with only one engine. Not bad, right? Unfortunately, it wasn't just one engine that went out in the case of Flight 1549. Birds took out all the engines. See, there are two important factors here, the size of the birds and the number of them. Engines are actually designed to keep going when they ingest birds. So swallowing a large number of small birds or a small number of large birds wouldn't be much of an issue. Only around 5% of bird strikes actually cause damage to an airplane. But the US Airways plane ingested numerous Canadian geese. Those are some pretty big birds. Another detail to remember is that the plane went down in just 90 seconds after leaving the ground. That's because birds fly relatively low in the sky compared to planes, so a collision is only likely when the plane is close to the ground, like during takeoff and landing. Around three quarters of bird strikes occur below 150 meters. Oh, and bird strikes almost always happen during the day since that's when birds are flying. Basically, it takes a very special set of circumstances to line up for birds to not only be ingested by a plane, but also stop every single engine from working. Heeding the warning to brace for impact, you clutch the chair in front of you for dear life and duck your head down, wishing you'd paid more attention to the security announcements. Then the airplane bounces and crashes into the water below. The impact of hitting the water tears up the plane, and there's a huge shudder. Everything goes dark, and you start to feel water flowing against your feet and legs. Freezing cold water. Terrified you won't make it out before the whole plane fills up with water, you jump up and try to head out through the back exit. But an attendant is shouting at everyone to go forward instead. As you make your way up the aisles, the youngest and fittest passengers are jumping and clambering over seats to get there as quickly as possible. Within seconds, the water is up to your waist, and by the time you reach the door, you can see the people at the back of the plane have water up to their shoulders. As you reach the door, you see the entire cohort of passengers sitting on the wings. You join them at first before jumping into a life raft. There's a couple of inches of water 
at the bottom, so it's freezing to be sat there. But at least you made it out. People are holding each other and crying. Some look like they can barely hold on for longer. But just four or five minutes later, you see safety boats heading your way. You can scarcely believe it. You made it out alive. It's easy to see why 1549 came to be known as the Hudson Miracle. Despite all the engines failing, every single passenger survived. It was all thanks to the plane's pilot, Chelsea Sullenberger, also known as Sully. Realizing what had happened, Sully was left with three options. He could turn back to LaGuardia Airport, try to land in the next airport in New Jersey, or do an emergency landing in the river. The typical procedure for a bird strike is to turn around, but Sully understood he was faced with a far more serious situation. Instead, he opted for option 3 and banked the plane to the left over the George Washington Bridge headed to the river. The rest is history. You might be wondering how he managed to steer the plane once the engine had already stopped working. Well, as long as the wings remain intact, the plane can be flown like normal. During a normal landing, the pilot pulls the engines to idle anyway. The challenge was landing in the river as if it were a runway and at exactly the right angle. Once the plane landed, it was buoyant enough to not sink immediately thanks to being filled with jet fuel, which is lighter than water. The role of communication in achieving this incredible feat shouldn't be neglected either. There are three key mandates in an aviator's handbook, aviate, navigate, and communicate. Sully and his co-pilot met their duty to communicate by letting air traffic controllers know what was happening. This was vital for ensuring first responders were able to arrive at the scene so quickly. Communication between pilots, flight crew, and passengers was also essential for keeping everyone calm. If the flight attendants hadn't made sure everyone followed safety procedures correctly and kept the back door of the plane closed, water might have come flooding in and the whole case would be a different story. So should we be worried about a bird strike? Yes and no. The outcome of bird engine ingestion is highly dependent on the circumstances circumstances of the flight. In 2007, a flight from Manchester to Lanzarote suffered engine failure when a bird was ingested and caught fire, but it returned safely. On the other hand, an Ethiopian Airlines flight in 1988 sucked in numerous pigeons in takeoff and ended up crashing and killing 35 passengers. The greatest loss of life happened in 1960 on a flight from Boston, when a flock of starlings damaged all four engines and the aircraft crashed, killing 62 passengers. These are somewhat extreme cases, but the phenomenon is more common than you might think. According to Transport Canada, bird strikes cost more than $500 million a year in North America alone. Although not all of these cases involve engine ingestion, but just because they're frequent doesn't make them dangerous. According to the Federal Aviation Administration, there have only been 25 human fatalities caused by wildlife strikes with aircraft. The birds, on the other hand, didn't fare so well. Is there anything we can do to prevent bird strikes? Not completely, but we can certainly reduce the chances. An important aspect of this is testing whether planes are airworthy and able to withstand unexpected collisions. Certification criteria require that large engines should be able to endure the impact of a bird over 3.5 kilograms without serious damage. Bizarrely, this is often tested by firing fake birds at airplane engines. It might sound brutal, but it's an important part of air safety. It's even better to avoid these kind of collisions altogether. Some airports now have radar based equipment on the ground to detect birds, and they may even broadcast the sound of predatory birds or produce loud bangs and flashes of light to keep them away. Mechanical falcons, trained falcons, and drones have all been used too, kind of like high-tech scarecrows. Unfortunately, birds always seem to adapt to a new environment and stop being scared by all the deterrents put in place. And airports are like a bird's paradise. Free food in a large empty area with green space nearby? If you're a Canadian goose, it doesn't get much better than that. The only way to stop birds getting ingested by engines completely would be to get rid of them altogether. But animal rights activists might have something to say about that. In fact, in the aftermath of the Hudson miracle, airports in New York started culling geese. Even two snowy owls were shot out of fear they'd fly into an aircraft. Naturally, this caused some controversy and is no longer considered best practice. Whatever we do, there's no way of getting away from freak accidents completely. As long as there are flying creatures roaming the skies, they might have undesirable collisions with our flying machines. So you don't need to cancel your next flight due to fear of bird ingestion, but you might want to pay attention to the safety announcement, just in case. When the Wright brothers first took off in their flying machine over a century ago, they never could have imagined how ubiquitous air travel would become. Approximately 100,000 flights take off and land around the world each day, with ticket prices getting cheaper and cheaper as the industry develops. After mankind had conquered the skies and made air travel a trivial affair, we look toward the next frontier, space. But as engineers design new types of spacecraft, some might wonder why do they go to all that trouble? After all, the planes can fly pretty high. Couldn't we just fly them a little bit higher? Say, all the way to space? Technically, the answer is no. We absolutely could not. But why? That answer is a little bit more complicated. 
Let's first look at how high planes can actually go. Commercial jets tend to fly at an altitude of around 28,000 to 35,000 feet, but they can reach heights of up to 40,000. Most of them aren't meant to go much higher than that, though there are exceptions such as the Concorde, a supersonic commercial jet that could reach a cruising altitude of 60,000 feet. NASA also designed an airplane called Helios that was able to fly up to 97,000 feet, but it was powered by electric motors and didn't resemble a typical airplane. Meanwhile, the minimum height required to exit the Earth's atmosphere and enter orbital airspace is 62 miles, or 327,360 feet. That's nearly 10 times the average height most commercial jets tend to fly. So, commercial planes and some scientific prototypes can't fly high enough to make it into space. But what is the reason for that? Why can't you just hop on a plane at LAX with a dream in your heart and soar off into the great unknown? Well, there are a few different reasons for that. First, there are forces that act on a plane. Lift, which pushes the craft upward. Weight, which pushes it downward. Thrust, which pushes it forward. And drag, which pushes it backward. Planes are designed with these forces in mind, and they're an essential factor in a successful flight. But in space, the gravitational force and air resistance ordinarily present are gone, and the forces required for the plane to act as intended are gone too. Next, there's the matter of temperature. Re-entering the Earth's atmosphere generates a great deal of heat. Space shuttles are equipped with protective shielding that allows them to endure this heat without falling apart, but planes aren't quite so resilient. Even if you were able to fly a plane into space successfully, re-entering the atmosphere would roast any passengers unlucky enough to be inside. Do not pay for an economy ticket to space, folks. It's just not worth it. Another obstacle standing between an ordinary commercial plane and space travel is the quality of air closer to space. The higher you go, the thinner the air becomes. At high enough altitude, the air becomes too thin for the plane to maintain its lift. At this point, the plane reaches something ominously called a coffin corner, in which it can no longer speed up, slow down, or climb any higher. The only way to keep the aircraft from crashing once in the coffin corner is by reducing its altitude while carefully gaining speed during a controlled descent. And then, there's the issue of the plane's engine. Commercial airplane engines are unable to generate enough thrust to propel a craft through the atmosphere and into space, which requires approximately 7.2 million pounds of thrust. For comparison, the Boeing 747's engine generates around 63,000 pounds of thrust. Airplane engines also rely on air in order to generate combustion. Without enough fresh air, that combustion ceases, and the engines die. Turns out, the air part of the airplane matters quite a bit. This would pose a pretty big problem in space, given that it's pretty famous for being a place without much air. So what would happen if a pilot decided to try their luck and fly their plane into space anyway? Well, like the Greek myth of Icarus in which the titular young man disobeyed his father and attempted to fly higher and higher using a pair of wax wings only to have them melt from the heat of the sun, they would suffer a terrible fall back to Earth. Surprisingly, this has actually happened with the most prominent example being the Pinnacle Airlines Flight 3701 in 2004. On October 14, 2004, Flight 3701 was due to transport an empty 50-seat Bombardier CRJ-200 from Little Rock, Arkansas to Minneapolis. The planned cruising altitude for the flight was 33,000 feet, but shortly after the plane left its destination, it began to ascend rapidly. After only 14 minutes of flight, the pilots requested clearance to climb to 41,000 feet the maximum operating altitude for the Bombardier CRJ series. They expressed to each other an eagerness to test the limits of the aircraft. Clearance was granted, and the plane quickly climbed to this ambitious new height. Once it did, however, disaster struck. Both the engines lost power, likely due to a sudden ascent to an altitude at the absolute limit of the craft's capabilities. The pilots declared an emergency and descended, but were unable to restart the engines. The flight crashed into the ground outside of Jefferson City and both crew members were killed. The National Transportation Safety Board listed the causes of the crash as, quote, the pilot's unprofessional behavior, deviation from standard operating procedures, and poor airmanship, which seems a little harsh given that they were already dead. If the pilot's goal was to get to space, well, let's just say they didn't get close. Only reaching 41,000 feet, they were over just 12% of the way to escaping our atmosphere. So, we know that airplanes can't fly to space, but there are actually a type of plane that can. That's right, you guessed it, space planes. A space plane is a vehicle capable of flying and gliding like an aircraft while in Earth's atmosphere and moving like a spacecraft once it's exited the atmosphere into outer space. It's sort of the best of both worlds. There are four types of space planes that have successfully launched into orbit, re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, and landed safely. 
the US Space Shuttle, the Russian Buran, the US X-37, and the Chinese CSSHQ, or Reusable Experimental Spacecraft. The Space Shuttle was a partially reusable NASA spacecraft system that was operated from 1981 to 2011. Its components included the orbiter vehicle, which served as the space plane, three rocket engines, a pair of solid rocket boosters, and an expendable external tank. The Space Shuttle launched vertically like a typical rocket. The solid rocket boosters would be jettisoned from the craft before reaching orbit as the main engines continued powering it. Then after the main engine cut off and the craft prepared to enter a steady orbit, the external tank was jettisoned as well. When it was time for the craft to re-enter the atmosphere, its thermal protection system kept it safe from the high temperatures and then it executed a runway landing as a space plane. In response to the NASA space shuttle, the Soviet Union started the Buran program. The Buran-class spacecrafts were similar to the space shuttle, but there were some notable differences in the design. The main engines did not follow the spacecraft into orbit. Instead, small rocket engines on the body of the craft helped propel it to orbit. It was also capable of fully automated landings and flying missions without a crew on board. The Boeing X-37, also called the Orbital Test Vehicle, is more of a modern space plane that was first used in 2010. It's made up of a reusable robotic craft that's carried into space by a rocket-powered launch vehicle, where it remains in orbit to aid in exploration and research. Once it's time for the X-37 to land, it'll re-enter the atmosphere and glide back to the ground as a space plane. The CSS HQ is China's answer to this new space plane arms race. It's a reusable orbiting spacecraft, first launched in September 2020, that operates similarly to the other orbiting space planes we discussed so far. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. In addition to these orbiting space planes, there have been two rocket-powered aircrafts that have crossed the internationally recognized boundary into space, the X-15 and Spaceship One. On July 19, 1963, American World War II pilot, physicist, and astronaut Joseph A. Walker flew NASA's X-15 in the now-famous Flight 90. During this flight, the craft reached an altitude of 106.01 kilometers, crossing the Kármán line and entering space. While up there, the interior of the craft achieved weightlessness for between three and five minutes. As it re-entered the atmosphere, some portions of the craft's exterior heated up to 650 degrees Celsius. This historic flight only lasted 12 minutes from launch to landing. Spaceship One took flight many decades later in 2004 as part of the competition for the $10 million Ansari X Prize. The challenge was as simple to describe as it is difficult to achieve. Be the first private organization to complete two successful piloted flights with two passengers in two weeks. Oh, and both those flights need to cross the boundary of space. This was achieved through several innovations working together. First, there was the launch aircraft, a hybrid rocket engine system named White Knight. This carried Spaceship One to a height of 47,000 feet and then dropped it. At this point, the pilot lit the craft's hybrid rocket, sending SS-1 shooting up toward its goal. Another element of SS-1 that allowed it to successfully complete its journey was the feather system. The feather here refers to the rear portion of the SS-1's wings, which would fold vertically before the craft reached its highest point. This would increase drag, slowing SS-1's speed as it prepared to re-enter the atmosphere. Then, the feather would be retracted, allowing the craft to glide to a smooth, safe landing. After a series of test flights, each creeping closer and closer to space, pilot Mike Melville made history on June 21, 2004, when he passed the boundary of space by 150 meters. How did he celebrate this momentous occasion? He spent his few moments of weightlessness at the top of the world, releasing chocolate into the cabin. How's that for a sweet victory? Spaceship One continued to prove itself with more and more flights into space, and today, it's prominently and proudly displayed at the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. In the decades since the first launch of the space shuttle, there have been few official developments in the world of space planes capable of entering orbit. The Boeing X-37B is the only craft still frequently used today and pales in comparison to its predecessors such as the space shuttle. So why aren't there more space planes rocketing off into the sky? Well, there are researchers trying to bring the reusable space plane back. Reaction Engines, a British aerospace company founded by three engineers following the cancellation of a British space plane project in 1989, intends to create Skylon, a single stage to orbit space plane. They're also designing an engine to power it. The Synergetic Air-Breathing Rocket Engine, or SABER, is a hydrogen-powered engine intended to use the oxygen in Earth's atmosphere 
to propel a space plane to hypersonic speeds before blasting off into space much in the style of a conventional rocket. There are some pretty impressive names attached to the project, such as Rolls-Royce, Boeing, and British Aerospace. So when can we expect to see Skylon in action? In April of this year, Reaction Engine CEO Mark Thomas spoke out about the project on the Aviation Extended podcast saying, what's more likely is a two-stage to orbit system, so you'd still have a very capable and fully reusable first stage launcher that could well operate in a horizontal takeoff and landing configuration, but you'd have a much more expendable or less reusable upper stage that did the ultimate push to orbit. So, okay, the future of aerospace technology is cool and all, but what about the non-astronauts who want to take a spin on a space plane while watching old NBC sitcoms and eating potato chips in an uncomfortably stiff chair? Will space plane travel ever come to the regular Joe consumer? Well, as it turns out, the first commercial space flights have already happened. British business magnate Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic, a spaceflight company aiming to usher in a new era of space-based tourism, completed its first commercial flight into space on June 29, 2023. The maiden voyage aboard the rocket plane Unity included an instructor, the plane's two pilots, two Italian Air Force colonels, and an aerospace engineer from the National Research Council of Italy. The suborbital ride lasted just 90 minutes as they experienced a few minutes of weightlessness at the highest point. The passengers unfolded an Italian flag in celebration. The first guests on Virgin Galactic were there as scientists just as much as tourists, one of them wearing a suit that measured his biometric data throughout the journey. Another conducted an experiment concerning the mixing properties of different liquids and solids in a low-gravity environment. There were some concerns about the safety of the trip following the deadly crash of Virgin Galactic's Spaceship 2 in 2014 and the disappointing results of Virgin Orbit's satellite launch, which ended abruptly when a rocket carrying the first-ever satellites to launch from British soil failed to make it to orbit. However, the flight went smoothly and people began clamoring to be on the next trip to space. At the time of this first flight, the company had sold 800 tickets for future trips. Now before you reach for your wallet, you should know the price is a little steep for the average space enthusiast, clocking in at around $450,000 a seat. Sorry folks, unless you're part of the 1%, commercial space travel is still a no-go. Ok, that's not exactly true. You could also be lucky enough to win a fundraising competition by the organization Space for Humanity, a nonprofit intending to make space travel more accessible. That's what happened to Keisha Shaha, who won a spot aboard the first Virgin Galactic flight for space tourists rather than passengers with professional experience. Shahoff, her daughter, and former Olympian John Goodwin climbed aboard the Unity in August of 2023, along with the space plane's commander, the pilot, as well as Virgin Galactic's chief astronaut instructor, Beth Moses. The Unity space plane was strapped to the wing of a Virgin twin fuselage VMS EVE carrier jet, which took off from a 12,000-foot runway in the New Mexico desert at around 11 a.m. Once the carrier jet reached altitudes of approximately 45,000 feet, it released Unity, dropping it from the wing much like you'd drop a bomb. But the only explosions involved in this vessel were mines being blown. A few seconds after Unity was dropped, its hybrid rocket motor ignited to propel the craft upward and out of the lower atmosphere. Its velocity steadily increased until it was around three times the speed of sound, and then the rocket motor shut down, suspending the crew and passengers in a few minutes of weightlessness. It continued to climb upward until it reached its maximum altitude of 54.9 miles. During the descent, while still weightless, the passengers were able to remove their straps and float freely through the cabin. Then, once everything was safely back in place, Unity feathered its wings, increasing drag to slow its descent, and began to make its way back to Earth. Once back in the atmosphere, it rotated its wings back into their original place and glided back to the runway. As impressive as the experience on board a Virgin Galactic space plane might be, the voyage is strictly suborbital. Is there any hope for a commercial space plane that actually enters orbit, like a space shuttle? Sierra Space is developing one, the Dream Chaser, a winged commercial space plane ideal for transporting cargo or even human passengers. Eventually, it could carry up to seven people as well as cargo back and forth from a point in low Earth orbit. The cargo version of the Dream Chaser is intended to resupply the International Space Station as well as transport cargo back to Earth from the ISS if necessary. For now, this version is being prioritized over the passenger-friendly version. But they're not stopping there. Sierra Space is aiming even higher than a winged space plane capable of transporting people to the ISS. They're also developing the Life Habitat, not the cereal or the board game, but the large, integrated, flexible environment habitat, 
a structure that launches via a rocket and once in orbit inflates to a height of three stories and a diameter of 27 feet. It's likely to be a while before it's ready, but the plans for this mobile habitat and workspace are ambitious. As the Sierra Space website put it, remote work will never be the same. They're promising three floors of living and working area, able to accommodate crews of between 4 and 12 people, life support systems that regulate the air pressure, humidity, temperature, and oxygen levels, a multi-layer shield able to withstand the harsh conditions of space, and an astro garden able to grow fresh plants and produce. It's quite a lot to accomplish, but they've already built a ground prototype, so who knows? Maybe sometime soon, working from home will expand to working from space. This is as far as the current technology will allow us to go when it comes to planes that can carry passengers to space. But here's another question. Once you've hopped onto that space plane, where are you taking it? What's the destination? Sure, maybe it's just space in general, but why stop there? Once we've taken planes into space, why not bring other aspects of flying along too? Such as the airport itself, with its various shops, eateries, and the oh-so-exclusive airport lounge. They're working on that too. Enter the Orbital Reef. Well, you can't enter it because it doesn't exist yet, but it's intended to be a mixed-use business park in space and the first commercially owned and operated space station, a station in low Earth orbit centered around commerce, research, and space tourism. The Orbital Reef promises to include the life habitat as well as the Dream Chaser space plane in its operations. It also promises a variety of uses and experiences, from business to a spacious research laboratory for physical, biological, or earth science, as well as product development, to pure tourism and curiosity about the experience of space. They intend for the Orbital Reef to be made reality by the decade. Sounds like something out of a science fiction story, but in August 2022, Orbital Reef's plans passed a system design review by NASA. This review, which was conducted from mid-June to mid-July, served to confirm that the concept for the Orbital Reef met the requirements to function as intended. Orbital Reef wasn't the only space station concept to pass the review. Starlab Station, a continuously crewed commercial space station, being built by Voyager passed the review as well as another commercial space station concept from Northrop Grumman Corporation. Another company, Axiom Space, reached an agreement with NASA to add commercial modules to the International Space Station itself. These will later be formed into a commercial space station if all goes according to plan. Now it all seems promising, but the talks of transitioning to commercial space stations by the close of the decade have not been met with only support. NASA's safety advisors and inspector general have criticized the short timeline, warning that these commercial stations might not be ready by the planned deadline. However, representatives from both NASA and the four companies involved in developing these stations disagree with those concerns. They're all making great progress, according to them, and Orbital Reef plans to launch its first modules in 2027. So while you can't fly a commercial jet into space, most people won't be able to snag a seat on a space plane either. As we develop better and better methods of space travel, it's entirely possible that a future is coming where ordinary people will be able to purchase a business class ticket to the stars. Sounds like a blast. When you're in 5th or 6th grade, you have a lot on your mind. There's that upcoming math test, what to say to the cute girl sitting next to you, or that after-school sports game you'll be playing in. Life can be a bit challenging at times, even under normal circumstances. But for Norman Allisted Jr., he had an additional problem. He had to figure out how to navigate an 8,600-foot-tall mountain in freezing temperatures, all by himself. Now that's what you could call an unsettling situation. So you might be thinking a circumstance like that is absolutely insane for an 11-year-old kid, and it is, without a doubt. But what's different about Norman from your regular middle schooler is that he had been preparing for this moment all his life. Unintentionally, of course. But because of his childhood upbringing, there was pretty much no extreme challenge Norman wouldn't at least have a fighting chance to survive. This was all thanks to his father, although at times, Norman didn't exactly feel gratitude. His father, the senior Norman Allisted, was what you might call a daredevil. Some would say he lived his life to the fullest, while others might see him as a bit crazy. An actor, athlete, musician, lawyer, and at one point even an FBI agent, there was nothing it seemed he wouldn't or couldn't do if he wanted to. That included some extreme pastimes. He lived in the prime of the California surfing culture and he embraced it with all he had as well as things like skiing the sheer slopes of exceptionally tall mountains. And he brought his son into it as well, and from the time he was barely walking. There's a picture of him with Norman Jr. as a one-year-old toddler strapped to his back as he stands riding a wave in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That's the kind of environment Norman Jr. grew up in, the kind where one wrong move could be your last one. 
As he grew from a tot to a young boy in Malibu, California, his father threw him fully into the sports of both skiing and surfing, but not as a typical father would approach them. Instead, Norman Jr. was skiing steep black diamond type slopes as well as riding raging waves along the Mexican coast. He was dubbed a boy wonder because of all he had done under the strong insistence of his father. While it's important to remember parenting wasn't quite the same in the 70s or 80s as it is today, this was still quite unusual even back then. And today, many of the things his father did may have landed him in jail. Things have changed in this area. But while Norman Jr. did admit he'd rather have been out riding his bicycle or snacking on cake from time to time, he also called his many adventures really beautiful, and they made unforgettable memories he would cherish for the rest of his life. More than that, the skills he learned gave him a chance at survival when he was later stuck in the middle of nowhere 50 miles from Los Angeles, on the top of the San Gabriel Mountains thousands of feet above the ground in a blizzard in February. But what was he doing on the mountain to begin with, you might be wondering? It all started at around 8 a.m. on February 19th of 1979. Norman Alstead Jr., his father and his father's girlfriend were flown via a single-engine Cessna 172 through mountainous territory en route to the mountain town of Big Bear to get a trophy he had won for a skiing competition. Along the way, the weather got unfriendly and suddenly everything turned gray. Clouds appeared all around the windows of the plane, pressing in on them. They could see nothing except an occasional object pop out here and there, and then again vanishing. Too late, they realized what they were, the limbs of trees. Soon the plane struck one and crashed along the mountainside, instantly killing the pilot and Norman Jr.'s father, and seriously wounding his father's girlfriend. Norman Jr. remembers three thuds as he made contact with the solid mountain. The third knocked him out. He doesn't know exactly how long he was passed out, but he awoke in excruciatingly cold temperatures. To make matters worse, his hand was broken. He found his dad and tried to get him to wake up, but he was unresponsive. Afraid of freezing to death, he and Sandra Cressman, his father's 30-year-old girlfriend, sat together under the wing of the plane in a desperate attempt to get warm. They waited and waited for hours until after seven had passed, they became worried that they could die before they were found. So they did the only thing left to do. They attempted to navigate down the mountain. Snow and ice were so deep that they reached Norman's waist, so he grabbed the stick and slid down on his bottom, thrusting the stick in the snow when he began to move too fast for comfort. With the long distance between him and safety, it was painfully slow going. Unfortunately, Sandra was not as adept at icy travel. She also had a deep cut on her forehead and a dislocated arm which definitely didn't help her situation. Despite Norma's attempts to help her down the mountain, she ended up falling in a particularly icy area. She never got back up again. As Norman described her, though she could open her eyes, she seemed to be so badly hurt that she can no longer talk. Her body was discovered later by a rescue team prone on the mountainside, 100 yards from the scene of the crash. Norman kept going. As he moved on, he heard a helicopter above him. He stood up and waved at it and thought they had seen him, but he was wrong. They flew on and left him alone, still stuck on the mountain. However, he pushed on. As his father had taught him throughout his youth, when the going gets tough, you just keep on going. So that's what he did. Giving up was never an option. He said he felt instinct take over and became an animal, similar to a wolf, an animal fully at home in the treacherous wilderness. Norman traveled two miles from the plane to safety on the ground by alternating stopping and sliding. He used the skills he had perfected through his extensive surfing and skiing experience to know the right angle to turn and how to best glide. He had complete control of his body and could pull off the moves necessary to get through particularly dangerous areas. He almost felt at home, as he put it, a 45 degree pitch in blizzard with slippery ice was nothing unlike what he had done for the last 8 years of his life. He was much more than prepared, even when it came to scaling a vertical gulch of stone using only his fingers. Still, it took him 9 hours to make it down. He then walked along a creek to a ranch house. A rescue party arrived on the mountain only after the clouds shrouding it had lifted. There, they saw the plane wreck and the three lifeless bodies resting on it. Norman Jr. was the only one who survived, and though he had a broken hand and a swollen face due to many cuts he sustained during the journey, he claimed to only be a little sore. In a wheelchair the day after the ordeal, he explained what had happened while his mother sat next to him. His parents were divorced by that time and Norman had questionable thoughts about the boyfriend she dated afterward, but he was beyond happy to be back with his remaining family. Later, Norman wrote a book about his experiences. Many would say it was mostly a book about his father and their at times strained and at other times magical relationship. As Norman put it, both were inextricably linked. 
He said that relationship was with him on that mountain, despite the fact that his father was already dead. The book, titled Crazy for the Storm, A Memoir of Survival, was a great success and lauded by critics. The picture on the book's jacket is him as a small child strapped onto his father's back as he rides a wave in the middle of the ocean. Norman Jr. wrote the epilogue to his own son, who he has raised responsibly yet in a way that he still learns crucial lessons in life, and the response from readers has been overwhelming. Norman has received numerous letters and emails from his readers talking about their own experiences with their mothers and fathers. Many seem to feel something deep and personal through Norman's story that resonates with their own lives. In the wake of a tragic disaster, many have come together to revisit their childhood. To say you're in a good mood would be an understatement. Your plane is up in the air, the keep your seatbelt fastened sign is off, you've just started to watch a movie and soon you'll get your hands on that gin and tonic you deserve. This time tomorrow, you'll be lying back on a beach in Southeast Asia, sipping an ice cold coconut juice. Your work woes a distant memory, but that vision is soon cut short when something strange happens. The engines on your plane have just stopped. You are thousands of feet above ground and you have no power. Does this mean you're a dead man? Is the date with a pristine beach off? The good news is this doesn't happen often, but the bad news is it does happen sometimes. According to the Federal Aviation Association and the National Transportation Safety Board, there are about 150 to 200 accidents in planes every year that are caused by the loss of power. This isn't just big passenger jets and is usually smaller planes losing power. Something like one quarter of these accidents end with fatalities, but as we said, this includes all planes and not just passenger jets. When we're talking about turbine engines, this hardly ever happens. But but again, it does happen. According to the FAA, the engine failure rate is 1 in 375,000 flight hours of flying time. It's unlikely you'll ever be on a plane whose engines fail, but you never know, it could be your unlucky day. So why would this happen in the first place? Well, there are many reasons you might get the shock of your life as you're halfway through that G&T. It would usually be just mechanical failure, that's the main reason this happens. But there are other reasons, such as oil leaks, fuel contamination, and external things like bird strikes, volcanic ash getting into turbines, or even the turbines getting too iced. In the world of flying and engine failures, we talk about contained and uncontained failures. Contained is when the engine kind of blows up on you, but all the broken pieces stay within the engine casing. An uncontained failure is when broken pieces explode out of the casing. As one person on an aviation website put it, when it's contained you have a problem, and when it's uncontained you have a huge problem. He used stronger language than that, but you get the picture. When things start flying around, the cabin windows can get smashed, and when that happens, people can get sucked out. This has happened, and we'll get around to that later. So what happens if the engines fail? Well, it's not something to be taken lightly, that's for sure. Ask the 124 people who were on the Baikal Airlines Flight 130 in 1994. Well, you can't ask them because they're all dead after having hit the ground. But we're not saying you should give up on that juice just yet. Because if you look at instances when engines have failed on passenger jets, there have been some good outcomes. The people on board those planes likely aged 10 years once they knew they had no power, but at least they lived to tell the tale. Let's now give you a real-life story of when this happened. In 2001, 293 passengers and 13 crew were in the air above the Atlantic Ocean on their way to sunny Lisbon. These folks set off from Toronto aboard Air Transit Flight 236 and were already full on the in-flight meal and dreaming of Portugal. Then the captain, Mr. Robert Pichet, declared an emergency. The plane had lost one of its engines, and by that we mean power, not that it just disappeared into thin air. If it wasn't bad enough, the other went 10 minutes later. The captain informed air traffic control that he had a major problem and asked where would be the nearest place where he could land the plane. He then glided the jet for a total of 75 miles and landed it at an Air Force base. This took some amount of skill as the crew had to circle around in order to lose some altitude. Apparently the landing was a bit bumpy too, but none of the passengers and crew were hurt. We're told this was the furthest a passenger jet airliner had glided in the history of aviation. How can such a huge chunk glide, you might ask? Surely it's too heavy for that, you might be thinking. Well, this is what the pilot and author Patrick Smith has to say about that. He told the British media, while it may surprise you, it's not the least bit uncommon for jets to descend at what pilots call flight idle, with the engines run back to a zero thrust condition. They are still operating and powering crucial systems, but providing no push. You've been gliding many times without knowing it. It happens on just about every flight. What he's basically saying is that just like when the power of your car stops while going downhill, a plane can just keep going. You'll keep losing altitude and all 
all kinds of planes have different ratios as to how much altitude they will lose over a given distance, but they'll come down smoothly most of the time. That's why the pilots on the Lipsenbaum flight had to circle around so that they could bleed off airspeed and land safely. The author we just mentioned said he knew of several times this has happened, and each time no one was hurt. It happened on a British Airways 747 flight on its way to New Zealand in 1982. The reason this time was volcanic ash getting in the turbines, thanks to Malt Galangung in West Java. The pilot's words then were, I don't believe it, all four engines have failed. He knew that he had a glide ratio of 15 to 1 and knew that he had to glide for about 23 minutes before he could land. This was his exact announcement to the passengers. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We have a small problem. All four engines have stopped. We're doing our damnedest to get them going again. I trust you're not in too much distress. Lucky for him and the passengers, the plane's engines kicked back in and everything was fine. They made an emergency landing in Jakarta and no one was hurt. It's not always smooth going though. In 2018, Southwest Airlines Flight 1380 was on its way from New York to Dallas when it experienced engine failure. But this time, the failure was uncontained and bits of the engine damaged the fuselage. A cabin window was smashed and this led to rapid depressurization. You've all seen the movie when someone gets sucked through a window on a plane, and that's what happened except it seems the person didn't get totally sucked out, just partially. The woman in row 14 had to be pulled back in by the cabin crew, but unfortunately she later died from her injuries. The plane landed and Donald Trump later thanked the crew for their bravery in a situation that could have been much worse. The airline gave $5,000 and a $1,000 voucher to every passenger, although at least one person sued the airline saying she now suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. No kidding, that must have been a very scary experience. And you can find a number of those uncontained engine failures when the fuselage was damaged. Most of the time, no one dies, but we found other instances when people were sucked through the window and it killed them. You hit that hole with some force. On one flight between Miami and San Francisco in 1973, a window was blown after engine fragments hit it. The guy that was sucked through the hole actually had his seatbelt on, but that didn't even keep him in. The report later said efforts to pull the passenger back into the airplane by another passenger were unsuccessful, and the occupant of seat 17H was forced entirely through the cabin window. This is why there's quite a difference between a contained failure and an uncontained failure. On that particular flight of 115 passengers, 24 suffered injuries, mostly related to smoke inhalation, ear problems, and just cuts and bruises. So if this happens to you, should you really be concerned about not getting to that beach? Well, it seems your trip will statistically likely go ahead, even though you'll have to deal with a bit of stress. One woman going from Singapore to Australia in 2010 said this is what she saw when the engine failed on her plane. There were flames, yellow flames came out and debris came off. You could see black things shooting through the smoke, like bits of debris. It's not really something you'd want to see when you're going on vacation, and it likely makes the in-flight movie a bit less interesting. But all 459 people on that flight were uninjured after the plane made an emergency landing. This was also the world's largest jet airliner at the time, so if that thing can glide down safely, you'd think your plane can. In fact, there are 25 such engine failures on passenger jets every year, which roughly translates to one one failure every million flights. If it happened to you, you could later tell everyone that you are one in a million. Your chances of survival are very good, but you never know, you might be the damned statistic. One of the worst cases of engine failure was United Airlines DC-10, which had to make an emergency landing in Sioux City, Iowa in 1989 after an uncontained failure. 111 died that day, but 185 people survived. Probably the most famous engine failures ever was a case of geese getting in the turbines. This of course was you US Airways Flight 1549. On this occasion, the pilot glided the plane down but famously landed it in the Hudson River. All 155 people on that flight survived. This time though, there were 5 pretty serious injuries and 78 people suffered minor injuries. We now know volcanic ash can cause a major problem and so too can pesky birds. But surely birds don't cause that many engine failures. Well, it does happen. Ask anyone who was aboard a Japan Airlines Boeing 777 in 2017. It had to make an emergency landing after just one bird got stuck in the engine. It safely landed in Tokyo and all 233 passengers and 15 crew were okay. 
But don't worry, the British Airline Pilots Association has said while bird strikes do happen from time to time, they are very rarely a problem, except of course if you're the bird. The bird doesn't come out well at all. You just better hope you hit a small bird because they don't cause much damage. Big birds, well, they're a different matter. One pilot said this about big birds. Hitting large birds such as Canada geese can and have caused serious accidents. The worst bird strike in history happened on Eastern Airlines Flight 375 flying to Boston in 1960. It hit a flock of starlings that damaged all four engines. Sixty people ended up in the grave thanks to those starlings. So in conclusion, there is a small chance your plane's engines can fail, but you'll likely get down safe. If it happens, it might not be an engine malfunction, but it could be a stray bird or volcanic ash. What you really don't want to happen is a bit of engine exploding through the fuselage, and you certainly don't want to be the person sitting next to the blown out window because at best you're going to get a bit of a sore head. But we don't want to worry you, and we think if your plane's engines do fail, you can feel pretty sure that with some delay, you'll still get to a beach in Asia and can avail yourself of the fresh coconuts. In one of the most remote and unforgiving wildernesses in the world, two strangers sit huddled in a makeshift tent they've built. The man and the young woman are freezing and on the verge of death. A snowstorm batters their makeshift tent. The wind blasts seem to the pair like nature itself has a vendetta against them. They're miles away from any town, and what they don't know is that as they sit and wait, the media is saying there is little hope the missing pair will be found alive. The storm abates, and suddenly the woman sees a plane in the sky, but her hope is crushed as it fades into the distance. In the name of God, she says, please come back. She's well aware she doesn't have long to live. The story starts at the beginning of the 1960s, a decade that would become renowned for its decadence and colorful youth culture. Just prior to that decade, there was the beat movement, a counterculture that enshrined something that would become known as the road trip, with Jack Kerouac's book On the Road inspiring many young Americans to take off and explore their own country from end to end. And that's just what a young Jewish girl from New York named Helen Clayman wanted to do, to follow in the footsteps of people who turned away from convention and instead went looking for adventure. When Clayman was just 20 years old, she saw an ad in the newspaper asking if anyone wanted to share the gas costs and take a car all the way to Fairbanks, Alaska. She replied, and the two set off on a long journey. After a few months in Alaska, she knew where she wanted to explore next, and that was the mystical East. She wasn't sure where she'd go exactly, maybe India, maybe Hong Kong, but before that she had to get to a destination to take a flight across the world. That destination was San Francisco, a city on the verge of a cultural revolution. Early in 1963, Clavin met a 41-year-old Mexican-American amateur pilot by the name of Ralph Flores. He was an aircraft mechanic that hailed from California, and he too wanted to get back home and leave Alaska. The pair agreed to share the expenses of the journey, and off they went to their first destination, which was the capital of the Yukon Territory, Whitehorse, the most populated place in that wild part of the world. They had another stop after that, and that was at Fort St. John in British Columbia. It was winter and bitterly cold. Snowstorms raged and the plane was grounded for three days. A small single-engine airplane couldn't hope to fly over such an unforgiving territory in such bad conditions. Nonetheless, with the weather warning still present, the two took off again into the sky. Their next landing would be anything but smooth. The pair flew for hours in strong winds, the plane being tossed around like a dandelion seed in a strong breeze. Flores could hardly see anything with the snow blasting against the plane. He and Clavin knew they somehow had to get out of that storm, so Flores attempted to get above the clouds and out of danger. His plan was to come back down and find the Alaska Highway, which would lead him to the airport. That was the thing. He needed the road to get his bearings because, being an amateur, he didn't quite understand the instruments in the aircraft. On top of that, he hadn't even packed emergency supplies on board in case of a crash. There were no real tools, not much in terms of food supplies, nothing to keep someone warm, and not even a gun in case they came up against a rather hungry animal. The Yukon is full of bears, small ones, large ones, and utterly fearsome ones. They at least had a knife. It was a time of desperation and Clavin started to lose her cool. She knew that the pilot was totally lost, but he refused to admit that. Then she suddenly saw a mountainside and some trees, and she knew they were going to crash. She said to herself, OK, Helen, here it comes, and it came with a bang. She closed her eyes and just hoped for the best, and when she opened them, she was alive. The plane had landed at the side of a mountain close to the Yukon-British Columbia border. She had a broken arm, and she had some broken ribs and a fractured jaw. There was nothing but mountains and trees around, and snow covered everything. 
Just walking around was an effort because the temperature at times would go down to negative 45 degrees Celsius. They huddled in the wreckage of the plane to escape the blistering cold. Frostbite was a certainty in these conditions if they stayed out too long in the open. As days went by, search parties flew over the skies and looked for the pair, but it was incredibly difficult to see anything in between the trees when everything is covered with snow. They literally had nothing to eat after they finished off some cans of sardines, tuna, fruit, and some crackers. There were no supplies at all after that, and they were only 10 days in. The one important thing they could do to survive was to melt snow for water. They had a box of matches and so could make a fire. With both of them in pain from their injuries and without the equipment to hunt, they just sat and waited and starved. Day by day, the pounds came off as their bodies burned their own fat reserves. Flores did try and make something that looked like a slingshot, but it was useless and he soon gave up on hunting rabbits. They did have another thing though, and in a way you might call that an emergency supply for the religious mind. It was a Bible, something Flores took everywhere with him since he'd converted to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was a devout Mormon. He told Clavin that this crash they'd experienced had some significance in regard to the bigger picture of things. He told her to read the Bible and they would be saved. She had to convert. Each day, they heard planes rumbling overhead, and each day Clavin continued reading the Bible, hoping her devout accomplice was right about his God. He actually told her that if she read the whole thing and then accepted the divinity of Jesus Christ, they would be saved. She wasn't exactly comforted by this and didn't believe him, but hey, there wasn't that much reading material in the middle of nowhere. Weeks now passed and they made a discovery. They found toothpaste, and that suddenly started looking tasty. Each day they squeezed the tube and gratefully swallowed the minty cream. They knew it wasn't really sustenance, but it was at least something to put in their mouths. They also had chewing gum and they chewed that for weeks on end. Things got desperate after a few weeks, and while they could at least keep themselves a little bit warm with insulation they had made out of clothes and cushions, Clavin got serious frostbite and then gangrene in her foot. She could now hardly move at all. She was all but ready to give up the ghost and had lost about a third of her body weight. Flores just told her to keep reading that Bible and never give up hope of rescue. Still, as time went by, even he seemed to have given up on one of those planes in the sky seeing them. Flores then told Clavin that since he could walk, he would go and try to find civilization. He walked off in the woods, leaving her behind to her own thoughts. She decided to write about what happened, but soon gave up on that when it started to sound like an epitaph. She wasn't ready to sign off just yet. Eight days later and Flores came back, he told his dying companion that he had at least found what looked like a clearing and so humans might have been there. There was also much more chance of someone seeing them from the sky once they were away from all the trees. They had to walk there and make a shack of some sort. It took hours to get there. Clavin's foot was badly infected now and the pain of walking was unbearable. As they got closer to the clearing, they heard a noise, like a humming, in the distance. Flores went in search of that noise and then returned sometime later. He told Clavin he'd found a frozen pond and that he'd written SOS in it and also etched the shape of an arrow that pointed to where they were. He'd done this with the snowshoes he'd made out of tree bark. He told Clavin he'd go out again with a mirror and try to catch sight of the pilot. She didn't want to be alone again, but he assured her that it was the only option now. Was there hope? It was day 47 of their ordeal, a day after Clavin had finished reading the Bible. And now we introduce you to a man of the wild, one Charles Chuck Hamilton. In March that year, as those two were freezing and starving to death, he was out in his plane trying to spot animals to hunt. He had a good eye for that kind of thing. He spotted no moose that day, but he did see SOS written into what looked like a frozen pond. He didn't immediately think about the missing plane. That had been weeks ago and it wasn't something that was still on his mind. In fact, he and his passenger thought that the remark must have been left by a trapper, seeing as trappers did sometimes find themselves in difficulty in the wild. At the same time, Clavin had seen the plane in the sky. She made a fire and frantically threw green pine on it. Black smoke gushed into the sky. Surely someone would see that. She was now in tears full of desperate joy, ignoring the pain in her foot. Flores was out in the woods trying to use the mirror to flash sunlight back at the plane. Hamilton actually had to turn away from the black smoke since it was so thick and heavy, but it was then he saw a man standing with a mirror in his hands. Hamilton found a place to set down the plane near a cabin on an airport lake. He was about six miles away from the pair. Trappers were working at this cabin and that's the noise the pair had heard. The trappers had been cutting firewood with the chainsaw. All these men got together with their dogs and set off to find the man with the mirror. Because of the smoke, Clavin hadn't yet been seen. Hamilton then left the trappers and said he'd investigate from the sky again, but now that fire had died down. When he looked at where the fire had been, he could just make out a tent. 
He then made a radio call and said, I think I found the lost people. Night was now falling, and so Hamilton returned home, hoping the trappers had found those people. The media called him all night long, but he couldn't sleep anyway, thinking about the poor souls alone out there. At this point, no one knew if there was just one survivor or two, since only the man with the mirror had been seen. Hamilton only guessed the woman was the source of the fire. The trappers actually did find Flores that night, but Clayton waited the whole night alone at the shelter. It was now pitch black and the rescue would have to wait until morning. Hamilton actually turned to his wife and said, what if she's dead when I get there? He flew off before dawn and landed a couple miles from where that tent was. From there, he walked in and about one hour later, Clayton saw a hulk of a man striding toward her. A man she said was pixie-faced. When he met her, she embraced him and cried and kissed his grizzled cheek. The brave woman said she could walk out even with a terribly infected frostbitten foot. Hamilton responded to that saying, if I can carry a moose out of the woods, I can carry you. It took some time though, walking on snowshoes with a woman on his back, a frail woman at least, who now only weighed 100 pounds. When Clavin was finally taken to a hospital, the doctor said she wouldn't have lasted one more night. Had they stayed another night, that SOS in the lake would have been covered. They were discovered in the nick of time. When Clavin was well enough, she met with a host of reporters, to whom she acclaimed, hey, I'm alive. She was all good except a few missing toes. Clavin soon went back to Brooklyn and Flores went home to his family in California. She never did convert and become a Mormon, but she later said the ordeal did make her more spiritual. The experience, she said, helped her to find herself. In an interview, she said most people expect they'd not be able to cope with the crisis and it was a great experience to find out that I could. Clavin wrote a book about what had happened and never lost her sense of adventure, traveling through many regions of Asia and Europe and the Americas. She died in 2018, aged 76. Flores was also 76 when he passed away in 1997, so we guess these two had one last experience they could share. The now old Chuck Hamilton left the wilds and moved to Victoria, where he lives today with his family. He keeps a token of the event in his basement, a bit of the wreckage with the serial number N5886. It is the single best documented case of non-human intelligence interacting with humans, and it's been ignored or kept secret by the government for over half a century. But in 1957, the United States Air Force collected definitive proof that it was not alone in the skies over America. What would follow is a culture of secrecy so deadly that modern whistleblowers like David Grush, a decorated U.S. intelligence official, have claimed that the government has killed to keep it a secret. On the night of September 19th to September 20th, 1957, a U.S. Air Force RB-47 was on a training flight prior to deploying to Europe. The RB-47 was a modified version of the medium bomber jet propulsion B-47 and built specifically for fighting a nuclear conflict. In the case of a nuclear war, the jet would be responsible for gathering weather information along bombing routes to facilitate subsequent strikes, as well as monitor radio and radar stations for either targeting or to help friendly air forces avoid detection. It was the foremost electronic warfare aircraft of its time, which is what makes its encounter with a non-human craft the single most credible UFO encounter of all time. The RB-47 in question was flying out of Forbes Air Force Base in Topeka, Kansas on a route that would take it out to the Gulf of Mexico and back again over the South Central US. During its flight, it would perform gunnery and navigation exercises while over the Gulf before swinging back around and engaging in electronic countermeasure exercises on the return back to base. The six-man crew included three electronic warfare officers, manning the most sophisticated ECM gear in the world at the time, and it would be this gear that confirmed their otherworldly encounter. As it would later be remarked, you could simply not ask for a better set of instruments to have been present during the encounter. The flight was supposed to be a routine exercise to prepare the crew before their rebasing to Germany. But as the aircraft crossed the Mississippi coast near Gulfport, the ECM gear detected a strange signal emanating from the plane's 5 o'clock position. To ECM operator Frank B. McClure, the signal appeared almost exactly like a ground-based radar signal, which would be used for area surveillance and directing of aircraft. However, the signal's origin was coming from out in the Gulf. McClure at first assumed that there was a problem with the equipment and that there was a 180-degree ambiguity causing signals coming from the 11 o'clock position to show as if they were coming from 5 o'clock. This would explain the strange radar pulse, as on the mainland there were numerous air traffic control radars active. He figured that the signal he was picking up was simply a radar operating somewhere in Louisiana, a suspicion strengthened by the fact that the signal he was picking up was at 2800 megacycles, a common frequency used by S-band search radars. However, McClure observed the strange signal suddenly move up scope, 
swinging over the nose of the aircraft and then moved down scope to the opposite side. This would have been impossible for even an inverted signal error or any ground radar to perform. Only a high-flying and very fast aircraft with a powerful search radar could have conducted such a maneuver. Either that or the top secret equipment McClure was instructed to destroy should the plane be forced to crash land was a pile of junk. However, the signal was so bizarre that McClure did in fact chalk it up to some unknown error. There was, after all, simply no possible way that any aircraft could be performing the radical maneuver that the sensitive ECM gear indicated was occurring. Thus, he did not report the incident to the pilots, nor even to his two colleagues operating the other ECM equipment. As the signal faded and the plane continued on, the incident was forgotten. But McClure had no idea that he had just recorded definitive proof that an extremely anomalous technological craft had scanned his own aircraft in a nearly 360-degree orbit. The aircraft continued on toward Jackson, Mississippi. The crew was busy performing a scheduled ECM exercise that consisted of detecting and taking action against Air Force ground radars that were along this leg of the flight. As the aircraft turned west over Jackson, though, pilot Louis D. Chase spotted what he believed were landing lights from another aircraft moving toward his own from the 11 o'clock position. The aircraft appeared to be nearly level with the RB-47 and was closing fast, becoming a very bright white light. Chase grew increasingly concerned as the unidentified craft sped straight toward him until he finally alerted the crew to be ready for extreme evasive maneuvers. Believing that he would collide with this unknown jet aircraft, Chase prepared to perform a sudden dive, but then the bright white light abruptly and instantaneously changed the direction of travel. In the blink of an eye, the light changed its trajectory from nearly head-on to their aircraft to the plane's 2 o'clock, moving so fast that Chase would later recall that it was like nothing he had ever seen or ever would see during his career. Just as suddenly, the light blinked out of existence. Chase and co-pilot James H. McCoy began to discuss the incredible event over the plane's interphone. In the rear of the plane, McClure remembered the strange radar signal that he'd recorded on his instruments and the way that it seemed to almost perform a full orbit around the aircraft as if scanning it with radar. He informed the pilots and the rest of the crew and then got the idea to set his number two monitor to begin scanning at the same frequency as the earlier radar receipt. To his surprise, he got a strong signal coming straight from the aircraft's two o'clock position, exactly where the pilot said the strange bright light had moved to just after it nearly collided with the aircraft. John J. Provenzano, operating another set of ECM equipment, performed a diagnostic on the number two monitor utilizing valid and known ground radar stations and confirmed that the equipment was performing optimally. He then used his number one monitor to double check the signal for himself and confirmed the exact same radar signal being broadcast at the aircraft from its two o'clock. The crew continued to monitor the signal, believing that there was a chance that this was simply a ground-based radar that coincidentally was in the same direction the unknown craft had taken. But as the plane continued along its flight path, the signal did not move down scope as would be expected from a stationary ground source. Whatever was blasting the aircraft with tracking radar, it was keeping perfect pace with them. Now the entire aircraft was alert and focused on this problem. They were being tracked by an unknown craft that was beyond the capabilities of any known American craft. Given the tensions of the Cold War at the time, there was a real concern that they might be dealing with an unknown Soviet craft of incredible capability. Chase decided to vary his flight speed to see if the signal would change. But with every variation in the aircraft's speed, the signal remained in exactly the same spot relative to the plane. For over a hundred miles, the unknown craft perfectly matched every maneuver that Chase made. By now, the RB-47 was approaching radar coverage area of the Carswell Air Force Base Ground Controlled Intercept Unit near Fort Worth, Texas. The crew contacted Carswell GCI and asked if they had any other air traffic close to their plane. Carswell would respond immediately that they were tracking another aircraft approximately 10 miles off their 2 o'clock position. The RB-47 was being tracked by both radar and its IFF transponder but this unknown craft was only being tracked by radar alone. This was alarming for the crew. While they might have had their suspicions about what they were being chased by, the lack of an IFF transponder confirmed for them a growing fear. This was not a friendly American aircraft. By now, the crew had time to analyze the signal better with their top secret gear. For all appearances, the signal was exactly what one would expect from a normal search and tracking radar, which the crew were extremely familiar with. The signal would not have been out of place at nearly any airport or military installation in the world. However, there was something entirely exotic about this signal. While it appeared like a perfectly normal, known human radar signal, even going so far as to simulate the scan rate, 
The signal was so powerful that according to McClure, the antenna would have had to been larger than an entire bomber to put out that much power. Something was masquerading as a normal, ordinary human radar, even simulating the scan rate of a mechanical radar, which emits pulse as it rotates, but it couldn't hide its massive power output on par with modern ground or ship-based search and track radar and far out of reach of any human military at the time. Suddenly, McClure saw that the signal was moving up scope on his number two monitor, confirmed by the immediate message from Carswell that the craft that they were tracking was moving forward of the RB-47. In the cockpit, the pilots couldn't see anything, and yet both the ECM gear and Carswell ground radar tracked the invisible object as it moved ahead to the nose of the aircraft, still keeping several miles of separation between them. Without warning, a massive red glow appeared directly ahead of the aircraft, with the pilots describing it as bigger than a house. Given the 10-mile separation between the object and the plane, this object had to be emitting quite powerful lights to cause the pilots to describe it in such a way. Now, there was independent confirmation of the object from the plane's ECM gear, Carswell's radar, and the pilots who were watching this strange red light keep pace with their plane directly ahead of them. Chase decided to try to catch up with the object, and increased speed to nearly 500 knots. However, the object maintained a 10-mile separation no matter how fast the RB-47 moved, until finally the strange craft began to veer to the right of the plane toward Dallas. Chase contacted the FAA and requested permission to alter his flight path so that he could follow the object. Confirming there was no other air traffic in the area, he was given permission, and Chase banked toward the object. As he picked up speed, the glow began to grow brighter, and he realized that he was finally catching up with it. Carswell then contacted the FAA to inform them that the unknown craft had come to a complete stop. This finally gave him an opportunity to get a good visual on the object, and Chase continued to fly directly toward it. The RB-47 closed in on the object from above, but as they neared it, the pilot suddenly saw the craft blink out of existence. At the same time, McClure announced that the radar signal had disappeared from his scope, and Carswell confirmed that they too had lost track of the object. Chase put the aircraft into a left turn to get back onto their flight path, and while banking the plane, they kept checking back in the direction they had come from for the object. Halfway through the 20-mile turn, they suddenly saw the red light blink back into existence, right along the path the aircraft had taken but at a much lower elevation. Carswell and McClure both confirmed that the object was back nearly simultaneously. Chase and the rest of the crew wanted answers, and thus he contacted Carswell and asked for permission to do something decidedly outside the purview of the RB-47's design. Chase wanted to dive the aircraft straight down onto the strange object to finally get a good look at it. After a brief deliberation, he was given the green light. Swinging the big plane around, he put it into a steep dive coming down on the object that was now below and ahead of the plane. Once the RB-47 reached around 20,000 feet though, the object once more blinked out of existence. Carswell and McClure both confirmed its disappearance once more simultaneously. The aircraft was now low on fuel and needed to head back to base. However, as the plane got back into a homeward course, McClure detected the radar signal hitting their aircraft from dead astern. The crew attempted to spot the object using the top blisters along the roof of the aircraft, but the unknown object was now behind and below them at an estimated 15,000 feet. The light would follow them all the way back to Oklahoma before finally disappearing. All in all, the RB-47 would be engaged by the strange craft for over 600 miles. The incredibly high-profile incident would come under review during the infamous Condon Report. Hired by the Air Force to study UFOs, Edward Condon put together a committee of investigators to come to a conclusion on the UFO phenomenon. In an infamous 1968 report, the committee would state that there was no credible evidence of non-human intelligence or advanced technology at work over the skies of the United States and that most incidents were simply misidentifications. However, Condon's credibility was questioned by both the public and the people who had been intimately involved in Project Blue Book, the source for the material that the Condon Committee reviewed. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, originally a skeptic on the UFO phenomenon, would not only come to be a believer himself as a result of his Air Force investigation, but would condemn Condon for an unscientific review of the material presented. Condon's credibility was further tarnished when it was revealed that he stated prior to his investigation that the UFO phenomenon was essentially a nothing burger, but he wasn't supposed to come to that conclusion until after his investigation. The Condon Committee's conclusion of the RB-47 incident would completely ignore significant portions of the events as told by the crew. It would also downplay the tracking of the unknown object via as many as four different instruments, 
as well as its identification by both intercepting its radar signal and being picked up on radar itself. The Condon investigation would conclude that if an object was truly following the aircraft, then the aircraft's own radar should have picked it up. However, the crew of the plane would explain that the radar currently on board the RB-47 could only track a tanker-sized target at a distance of 4 miles. This would mean that for the aircraft to pick up the object on its own radar at a distance of 10 miles as confirmed by Carswell, then it would have to be over twice as large as an airborne tanker. The RB-47 incident remains to this day the best publicly known evidence of a non-human technology over the skies of America, as confirmed by top-secret electronic monitoring gear of the day. It could very well be the first recording of an alien signal, which seemed to at least attempt to hide its origin by mimicking human radars, but it could not hide its power output, which if human would have required an antenna as big as a football field. January 3, 1943. During an air raid, B-17 bombers darkened the skies over Nazi-occupied Saint-Nazaire, France. An attack from German anti-aircraft artillery rips through a gun turret on one of the planes. Thankfully, the gunner, U.S. Army Air Force Staff Sergeant Alan McGee, is unharmed, but his parachute has been shredded. Suddenly, more flak blows off part of the plane's right wing, setting the bomber aflame and sending it into a deadly tailspin. What happens next is miraculous. McGee blacks out and is thrown clear of the plane. He falls over 4 miles, some 22,000 feet, and lives. He crashes through the glass roof of a train station, suffering severe injuries. However, German doctors nurse him back to health, and McGee spends most of the rest of World War II as a POW. Interestingly, Sergeant McGee isn't the only person to have survived falling out of an airplane. On January 26, 1972, Vesna Vulovich, a flight attendant, was the sole survivor after a bomb exploded aboard the JAT Yugoslav Airlines flight JU-367. She fell some 33,330 feet, earning a spot in the Guinness World Records for surviving the highest fall without a parachute. Also, who can forget brave Yuliana Kopka, whom we profiled in our episode She Fell 10,000 Feet and Survived 11 Days in the Amazon Rainforest. Yuliana survived an incredible two-mile fall and then a trek through the jungle while severely injured. We don't even think we could survive a two-mile jog, let alone a fall. How common is it to survive falling out of an airplane, though? Is there anything you could do to improve your chances of surviving? The median lethal dose for falls is four stories, or about 48 feet. This means that 50% of people who fall from four stories will sustain fatal injuries. It only gets worse as height increases. At seven stories or 84 feet, the chance of survival are one in 10. So unfortunately, the chances of survival in falling out of an airplane plane are pretty slim. No official statistics exist, however, according to various aviation accident websites, there are less than 50 known cases of survival when falling from a plane. That would include falling out of an airplane without a parachute like Sergeant McGee, or falling attached to airplane debris like Vulovich or Kepka. If you're gonna survive the plummet, it's better to fall from the cruising altitude of a commercial flight, which is typically around 35,000 feet, rather than a shorter distance of 1,500 feet. That sounds a little crazy, but hear us out. Falling from around 1,500 feet, or a distance just a little taller than the Empire State Building, means you'll reach your terminal velocity before you hit the ground. As gravity pulls you toward Earth, you fall faster. However, at the same time, your drag increases. When downward force equals upward resistance, acceleration stops, and you'll reach the fastest speed you'll descend at, or your terminal velocity. For average adult humans, this is around 120 to 130 miles per hour. So the impact speed is the same whether you fall from 35,000 feet versus 1,500. What's different is time. 1,500 feet is going to only give you approximately 10 to 12 seconds of free fall before impact while falling from 35,000 feet or over 6.6 .6 miles will give you about 3 minutes of free fall before you potentially become a pancake. Actually, before and as you fall out of the plane, if possible, grab a hold of plane debris. Becoming a wreckage rider, a term coined by Jim Hamilton, creator of the Free Fall Research website, a database cataloging known free falls, can help you survive the plunge by adding some protection and even somewhat cushioning your fall. Also, the larger surface area of the debris increases air drag, slowing your descent. Flight attendant Vulovich felt jammed between her seat, a catering cart, and the body of another crew member, and a section of the airplane. 
Though she was severely injured, being enclosed in debris helped to shield her from the worst of the impact. Based on statistics from plausible freefall incidents, you're more likely to survive if you're attached to debris than a freefall solo. While freefalling from 35,000 feet, you have enough time to possibly make some very quick decisions on how to mitigate your impact. However, there are drawbacks from falling from such a high distance. At higher altitudes, it's extremely cold. The temperature at 35,000 feet is often in excess of negative 67 degrees Fahrenheit. A reaction to the cold or rapid change in temperature as you drop is possible. However, there are no reports detailing how individuals have been affected. Frankly, temperature is the least of your worries. At 35,000 feet, oxygen is thin. It's likely that you'll experience hypoxia and spend roughly the first minute of your fall unconscious. You might stay unconscious for the duration of your fall and be spared the last few terrifying moments of your life, but most likely you'll come to once you've fallen around 2 miles. Of course, how fast you're falling and how quickly you regain consciousness are tied to several variables that we cannot account for, such as air currents, the trajectory at which you leave the plane, your mass and personal blood oxygen saturation level. Once you awaken, you'll have around 2 minutes left to execute execute any strategies for survival. The first thing you want to do is calm down. We get it, it's extremely hard to adopt a zen-like attitude when death is most likely imminent, but take a deep breath and try anyway. Although you've regained consciousness, your body is still feeling the effects of hypoxia. If you panic, it's really easy to hyperventilate. Slip back into a blackout and lose valuable freefall seconds you could be using to mitigate your injury or fatality. You need all your wits about you to focus on planning your landing. You cannot do that if you're freaking out. Great, now that you've taken a split second and gotten a hold of yourself, the next thing you want to do is to attempt to slow your fall and gain a few extra seconds of precious freefall time. A good position to create wind resistance is the classic skydiver's pose called the box. To assume, flip onto your stomach and arch your back, lifting your head and shoulders slightly. Spread your arms and legs equal distance. Bend your arms at the elbow. Also, bend your knees about a 45 degree angle, leaving your lower legs slightly extended into the wind. Not only will this position help to slow your descent a little, in skydiving it's considered a neutral, stable freefall position from which other maneuvers are performed. From the box, you can move into the slowdown position. Lower your head, turning it to one side, straighten your arms, and further extend your legs, spreading out into an X. Flatten your torso, point your feet and toes as much as possible, and tense your muscles, deliberately pushing against the air. This position provides the greatest resistance possible. If you start to wobble or flip, return to the skydiver's box posture before trying the slow fall position again. Now, take a quick look around. It's unlikely, but you may have a second chance at grabbing a hold of some plane debris to cushion your fall. If suitable wreckage is falling nearby, you may want to try to angle yourself toward it so you can grab on. Skydivers form formations before deploying their parachute, so it's possible to steer toward and grab a hold of objects while falling. However, maneuvering during skydiving does take practice, and generally, it's not something you do on your first jump. Remember, time is at a premium and it's better to get yourself in the best position possible for impact rather than crash land in a poor position because you were chasing debris. Whether maneuvering to reach debris or aiming for a landing spot, here are some basic moves for steering. From the box position to turn yourself left, deflect more air off your right arm than your left by moving your left arm down and your right arm up in equal proportion. Imagine an airplane banking, that's exactly what you're doing. To turn right, do the reverse, right arm down, left arm up. You'll continue to turn according to your arm actions until you resume the neutral box position. Another common skydiving move is tracking or moving horizontally while freefalling. For a basic side tracking stance from the box position, straighten your arms and legs. Bring your arms to your side and rotate them out slightly so your palms are facing downward. Flatten your back, lower your head, and curl your body in just a little. Frankly, you're not going to have much time to think about proper skydiving form, so do whatever movement that seems to alter the direction of the drag force acting on your body to try to produce the desired motion to guide yourself. Your next step is to look down for a suitable landing area. It's best if you can land on or in anything that offers give, such as a tree canopy, haystack, or a snowdrift. Swampland or grass are better than plain ground. Even power lines are preferable to the ground because they break your fall. Any ground cover that spreads your impact over a longer period or absorbs it in stages could mean the difference between a couple of broken bones and severe trauma to internal organs. Try not to land in water. It can be as dangerous as landing on concrete. Firstly, you have no way of determining depth. Even when the water is deep enough for landing, once you break the surface of the water, your velocity drops almost instantaneously to zero, exerting strong g-forces on your body. 
If you must land in water, try to minimize impact by assuming postures that cause a minimum surface area of your body to bear the brunt of the force. That would be a pencil dive position. Jump feet first with your arms held slightly to your sides and your feet pressed together and pointed downward. You're striving to enter the water in a straight vertical line. Also, clench your muscles, especially your butt muscles, unless you want a painful and damaging forced enema. Among experienced cliff divers, injuries such as broken bones, spinal compression, and concussions occur. Even if you survive the dive into the water with only a few broken bones, you may be stunned and slow to respond. Watch out, it's easy to ingest water and possibly drown. To minimize body impact on landing, many researchers think the best posture to assume is one similar to a parachute landing fall. That means landing on the balls of your feet with the legs together and your knees a little bent. Immediately allow your body to crumple slightly backwards and into a horizontal position while turning toward one side of your body as determined by dominant directional speed. Basically, you're attempting to distribute the force of the landing step by step up your torso along five points of body contact with the ground – feet, calf, thigh, hip or buttock, and the side of the back. Also, you should tuck your chin and wrap your arms around your head for protection as you land. Furthermore, relax your body as much as possible. This allows you to use your body's natural elasticity to help slow things down over a greater unit of time. Ultimately, you're sacrificing the long bones in your legs, which can absorb a large amount of impact energy before fracturing, for the good of your torso. No matter how you land, of course, you want to try to protect your head and neck as much as possible. Landing head first almost certainly guarantees death. July 23, 1983, one minute until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. A red light starts flashing in the cockpit of Air Canada Flight 143. Captain Bob Pearson furrows his brow and taps the light, thinking it must be a malfunction. The warning light is indicating that fuel isn't being pumped into one of the engines. Pearson leans over to the first officer, Maurice Quintal. You seeing this, he asks. Quintal nods his head. It must be faulty wiring or something. I'm telling you, these new Boeings are full of kinks. Suddenly, the plane jerks. A series of new lights begin to flash. What the hell? Pearson says. He begins checking various dials and gauges. The engine on the left wing begins to whine as it slows down. This can't be right, Quintal says, holding the flight manual in his hands. Everything that is happening indicates we're out of fuel. The plane begins to lose altitude. There's another jerk, and the right engine sputters to a stop. We're going down, Pearson yells. Find me a place to land. Three months before Flight 143 runs out of fuel. All right, Bob, let's try out the next scenario. The training officer for the new Boeing 767-233 says, Your right wing engine has failed. What do you do? Pearson goes through the motion step by step. He adjusts the throttle, compensates for the loss of power, and begins a controlled descent. The trainer ticks off a series of boxes on his clipboard. Nice work, Captain, he says. Bob Pearson smiles. He loves flying and has logged countless hours behind the flight stick. However, his passion is gliding. He is one of the most talented gliders in the country, so it's only natural for him to ask this next question. What is the protocol if both engines go out? The trainer pauses. That would never happen, he replies. I mean, I guess if the plane completely ran out of fuel, it's possible, but that'd be really bad because all the electronics run off the power generated by the engines. The pilot would basically be flying blind. That's why we have a number of fail-safes in place to make sure there's always one engine running. Bob Pearson nods his head. Sounds simple enough, as long as the plane has fuel, there's no reason to worry. But he's still curious. That makes sense, Pearson says, but what if both engines did go down? The flight trainer looks him dead in the eye. It'll never happen, so we don't run through that scenario in training. Pearson lets it go, but he can't help but feeling that it could be a fatal mistake to not have at least a protocol in place if both engines stop working. However, he's just a pilot, and somebody else gets paid a lot more money than he does to make these types of decisions. July 21st, 1983, two days until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. In September of 1981, the Boeing 767 flew its maiden flight. Sea Gone, the aircraft that would be given the designation Flight 143 in the coming days, was the 47th Boeing 767 to be built and had been flying for four months. Since its introduction into the fleet, 55 changes needed to be made to the Master Minimum Equipment List, or MMEL. What the MMEL dictates is which systems are inoperative on the aircraft. This might sound crazy, as most people would think every system on the plane should be working before it takes off with passengers, but this is not the case. When Flight 143 took off in the coming days, this list would indicate some pretty important systems were not operational. July 22, 1983, one day until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Come on, a technician says while deep inside the belly of the plane. 
he pulls out a faulty sensor in the fuel quantity indicating system. It's been giving pilots troubles for days. The only way to be sure that the aircraft had enough fuel to reach its destination was by doing the refueling calculations by hand. These new 767s are pieces of junk, the technician says, tossing his tools in the truck. He takes out the aircraft's logbook and creates a new entry. The technician continues his routine maintenance check, a little annoyed that things keep having to be fixed on this aircraft. Little does he know the inoperable sensor will be one of the key factors which leads to this very plane running out of fuel and plummeting to the ground within the next 24 hours. July 23, 1983, 12 hours until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Captain John Weir and Captain Donald Johnson walk through Edmonton Airport toward their gate. They're scheduled to fly to Toronto and then to proceed to Montreal. They smile at the flight attendants as they enter the plane. When they get into the cockpit, there's a clipboard with several updates written on it. The two pilots begin conducting their pre-flight checks when there's a knock behind them. Good morning, gentlemen, a technician says. I got good news and then bad news. Which do you want first? The two pilots look at each other. Let's start with the good news, Weir says. The technician tells the pilots that the plane, for the most part, looks good and the forecast calls for clear skies. Then the bad news comes. Last night, the techs found a faulty fuel sensor, so we'll need to take manual readings using the dipstick. The pilots shake their heads. It's not a great way to start the day. But the worst part was all the calculations and conversions that needed to be done by hand. Rather than just reading the fuel gauge, the pilots need to use pencil, paper, and a slide rule to ensure they had enough fuel to make it to their destination. Of course, Weir and Johnson had been trained to do this, and it was a requirement to become a pilot, but manual readings left room for human error, and in the coming hours, disastrous errors would be made. The readings from the dipstick were taken and converted correctly. Everything was recorded in the flight log before the plane was fueled and ready to leave Edmonton for Toronto. You're all clear for takeoff, have a good flight. The control tower says over the headset. Captain Weir pushes the throttle forward. The aircraft lurches. The G-force pushes pilots and the passengers back into their seats as the 100-ton metal bird rises to the sky. Passengers look out their windows as the cars and houses below become nothing but pinpricks on the vast Canadian landscape. July 23, 1983, eight hours until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Liam slams his fist against the blaring alarm on his bedside table. It's early afternoon in Montreal, but he's still exhausted from his night shift at the factory. He's been putting in extra hours to save up for his trip out west to visit Elk Island, Banff, and several other national parks. It's always good to get out of the city and spend time in nature, and he needs it now more than ever. His engagement has been called off after his fiancée got offered a job halfway around the world to pursue her goals of providing medical aid to those in war-torn countries. Liam encouraged her to make her dreams a reality, but in doing so, they both knew a long-distance relationship would never work. He reluctantly let her go to make the world a better place, with a broken heart but pride for what the woman he loved would accomplish. About a year later, Liam booked his trip, and now he's looking forward to exploring part of Canada he's never been to before. Liam gets out of bed and finishes some last-minute packing before making his way to the Montreal airport. Six hours until Flight 143 runs out of fuel, Captain Weir gently lowers the 767 onto the tarmac and engages the brakes to slow the craft. It's a clear day. During his descent, he could see the skyline of Montreal in the distance. He lets out a sigh and stretches his neck. That's it for today, he says to Johnson. Both pilots are done with their shifts and will be staying in Montreal until the following day. The plane taxis to the gate and comes to a stop. The sounds of seatbelts unbuckling the moment the captain turns off the fastened seatbelt sign echoes through the cabin. The passengers grab their bags and proceed off the aircraft as the flight attendants and pilots thank them for flying with Air Canada. Weir and Johnson gather their things from the cockpit. You want to grab a drink at the bar before heading to the hotel? Johnson asks. Weir nods his head and the two pilots disembark making sure to thank their co-workers who've already begun cleaning the cabin for the next set of passengers. Liam sits at the gate and watches two pilots walk through the jetway and exit the airport. They approach two men dressed in the exact same suits and hats with the Air Canada logo on them. The pilots stop and talk to each other for several minutes. Liam looks up at the sign above the entryway to make sure he's at the right gate. It reads, Flight 143 with service to Ottawa and Edmonton. He waits patiently for the announcement to line up and board the plane. 5 hours and 45 minutes until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. The avionics technician enters the empty cockpit of Flight 143. He reads a logbook and notices there have been several notes written about a faulty fuel sensor. Just to make sure that the sensor itself was the problem, the technician turns the system on so the FQIS can perform a self-test while he waits for the fuel truck. The test fails, just like it said in the logbook. P-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-
piece of junk, the technician says as he closes the MMEL. He's about to turn off the system and return it to the way he found it when the fuel truck arrives. The technician rushes out of the cockpit to tell the fuel team about the sensor problem and that they'll have to wait. However, a fatal flaw is made. The technician never goes back to disengage the FQIS system after the failed test. The fuel gauges are now blank, making it seem like the system was never turned on and masking the fact that the technician was running a test. Five hours until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Mom, we're going to be late if we don't leave now. Sophia yells up the stairs to her mother, who's still getting ready to drive her to the Ottawa airport. She just finished up her master's degree in environmental science and conservation and decided to treat herself to a little time outdoors before applying to jobs with the parks department. Her plan is to explore some of the wildest places in Canada. She's starting her journey a little further west in Edmonton. Sophia impatiently taps her foot as she hears the creak of floorboards above, signaling her mother is once again going to check her outfit in the mirror. Mom, you look great, let's go! A slightly muffled voice says, You can't even see what I'm wearing. I'm going to try on one more outfit. Sophia slaps her hand against her forehead and paces back and forth. She hates being late to anything, but especially the airport. She's someone who is always at least three hours early to her gate just to make sure that if there are long lines or traffic, she has plenty of time to spare. With each minute that passes, Sophia gets more and more anxious. I'm calling a cab! She yells up the stairs. Her mother appears at the top, still putting on an earring. All right, I'm coming, I'm coming, she says. Thank God, Sophia replies. She grabs her bags and heads out to the front door to the car. Before she hops in, she checks one last time to make sure she has everything. She reads her ticket and looks at the flight number. It says Flight 143. Four hours until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Captain Bob Pearson and First Officer Maurice Quintal continue their pre-flight check. Their flight plan has them stopping in Ottawa, where they'll pick up more passengers before continuing to their final destination in Edmonton. Pearson reads through the notes left by the previous flight crew. When he had passed Weir in the airport, the previous pilot had told him about a faulty FQIS sensor. Pearson leans over to Quintal and shows him the note. This is what Weir was talking about. We're going to have to calculate the fuel by hand. Pearson taps his finger against his lips as he thinks. Let's load this bird up with enough fuel to get us all the way to Edmonton. We're already behind schedule. It'll save us a few minutes if we don't need to wait for the fuel truck in Ottawa. Quintal agrees, and they start running the numbers to figure out how much fuel the tank needs. Unfortunately, now that everything needs to be done by hand and double-checked, the flight is becoming more and more delayed. Pearson gets a dipstick measurement of the fuel levels. The fact that the plane is relatively new throws him off from the start. The 767s require that all fuel slips be written in kilograms per liter, while every other aircraft is documented in pounds per liter. Without thinking, Pearson uses the conversion that he's been using on other aircraft. The first mistake happens when Pearson converts the 7,682 liters of fuel in the tank to 13,597 pounds of fuel instead of kilograms. And since one pound is only 0.45 kilograms, that means that his calculations are off by over half. The computations show that in order to make it all the way to Edmonton, the plane would need 8,703 kilograms worth of fuel, when in actuality the tanks need 16,131 kilograms. When all said and done, the order for fuel should have been for an additional 20,088 liters. However, Pearson only orders 4,917 liters, which is exactly how much the fueling team puts in. Unknown to everyone working on the plane and the flight team, they'll have enough fuel to reach Ottawa but not Edmonton. Their only hope is that someone will realize the mistake before Flight 143 takes off from Ottawa. However, due to another series of unfortunate events, no one will notice the fuel tanks are not full until it's too late. Three hours and 20 minutes until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Sophia runs through the Ottawa airport toward her gate. She has a terrible feeling that when she reaches the plane, the doors will be closed and the flight team won't let her on. She rounds the corner. I'm here, I'm here, she shouts. The Air Canada representatives standing at the desk look at her in confusion. They point out to the sign above them. It says, Flight 143 has been delayed. Sophia lets out an exhausted breath and sits in a chair facing the window so she can watch the planes take off and land. She had plenty of time, but to her, being less than an hour early for your flight is the same thing as being late. Three hours until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Sorry about the delay, we should be getting underway shortly. Flight 143 was supposed to depart 20 minutes prior, but due to the fuel system being inoperable and the necessity of doing the refueling calculations by hand, they're behind schedule. After a few more minutes, Captain Pearson gets the all clear from the refueling team and the technicians. Plane is ready for takeoff. All right, can tell, let's get this show on the road, Pearson says. 
They conduct one last round of checks and maneuver their craft toward the runway. At 5.30 p.m., Flight 143 takes off from Montreal and flies toward Ottawa. It'll be a quick flight, and the plane will only be at cruising altitude for a handful of minutes before they begin their descent. Liam looks at the empty seat next to him and briefly thinks about his lost love. Then he shakes his head to clear the thoughts and looks out the window. He kind of wishes there was someone sitting next to him just to talk to. He isn't the biggest fan of flying, and company would be nice, but maybe when they land in Ottawa, someone will take the seat. Two hours and 15 minutes until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. The airplane rolls up to a stop in Ottawa. Since the flight was already behind schedule and the pilots believe they have enough fuel to reach Edmonton, no additional fuel is added. A technician takes a dipstick measurement and glances at the pilot's calculations. Seems like everything checks out and therefore doesn't do a more thorough investigation into the faulty fuel system or the fuel calculations. The Ottawa passengers joining the flight begin boarding the plane. Sophia walks down the aisle looking for her seat. Now that she's on the plane, her anxiety has been greatly reduced, and she has an easy smile on her face. She proceeds further toward the back of the craft and spots her row. There's an empty seat next to a man looking out the window. His elbow is on the armrest, jutting out into where she needs to sit. Excuse me, sir, Sophia says. This is my seat. A soft voice breaks Liam out of his daydream. He turns away from the window to see a woman standing in the aisle looking at him, but she isn't exactly looking at him so much as his elbow. He looks down and sees that he's leaning into the seat next to him. Oh, I'm sorry, Liam exclaims. He slides over so the woman can sit. She plops down next to him and lets out a heavy sigh. Oh, I didn't think I was going to make the flight, she says out loud. Good thing you were delayed in Montreal. Liam smiles. Yeah, we were sitting on the tarmac for a while, but I guess they figured out whatever the issue was. I'm Liam, he says, holding out his hand. The woman takes it and shakes. Sophia, it's nice to meet you, Liam. The last of the passengers take their seats, and the flight attendants close the door. Captain Pearson is given the go-ahead by the flight tower. The fuel gauges are still blank, but he doesn't even give them a second thought. The engines roar to life and Flight 143 lifts off into the air. The plane starts to rise slightly sooner than expected, as if it's lighter than it should be, but the pilots just chalk it up to an updraft or something similar. There is no indication that in the next couple of hours, things are going to go terribly wrong and Flight 143 will plummet toward the Earth below. One hour until Flight 143 runs out of fuel. The hum of the engines fill the cabin. A baby coos near the front of the plane. Flight attendants walk up and down the aisle offering beverages and snacks. Toward the back of the plane, Liam and Sophia are talking. I can't believe we're all visiting the same parks, Liam says. Maybe we should just travel together and save on gas, Sophia replies. She's only joking, but there is a part of her that finds the man sitting in the next seat fascinating and not wholly unattractive. I mean, it would make sense, Liam says with a laugh. Ever since Sophia sat down, the two haven't stopped talking. They both have an intense love of the outdoors and have chosen to spend their hard-earned vacation time exploring national parks. One of the flight attendants comes by. Can I get you to anything? She asks. Maybe a glass of wine? Liam looks at Sophia. Sure, why not? She says. We still have a few more hours to kill until we get to Edmonton. The flight attendant walks away with a smile on her face. These two wouldn't be the first passengers she's seen meet on a plane and leave together. The flight has been smooth. The sun casts an orange glow through the windows. Seems as if this will be a pleasant flight for everyone. 8.02 p.m. Two minutes before Flight 143 runs out of fuel. Captain Pearson and First Officer Quintal sit in the cockpit, talking about the previous year's hockey season. Quintal looks out the window and sees Red Lake, Ontario below. The plane is cruising at 41,000 feet or just around 12,500 meters. A buzzing sound fills the cabin. Quintal looks around. Pearson sees a series of blinking lights. Everything is indicating that there's some sort of fuel pressure problem on the left side of the aircraft. You think it's just another malfunction? Quintal asks. Pearson looks at the different warning lights. Ah, it's probably just a failed fuel pump. We should be fine. The engine can be gravity fed since we're leveled off. The pilots flick a couple of switches and the buzzing stops. In the cabin of the plane, no one is even slightly aware there is a problem. Liam and Sophia continue to talk. Businessmen sleep. Parents keep their children entertained. In the next few minutes, everything will change and screams will fill the aircraft. 8.04 p.m. Flight 143 runs out of fuel. A different alarm in the cockpit begins going off. This time it's indicating there's a problem with the right engine. Ah, this can't be coincidence, says Quintal. Pearson looks at him and grabs the yoke. The only way both engines could have pressure issues is if we are out of fuel, Pearson says. What's the closest airport we can land at? Quintal pulls out a series of maps and charts. The engines are still running, but lights are flashing through the cockpit. It's clear something is very wrong. Winnipeg, says Quintal. If the engines keep going for a little while longer, we can make it to win. At that moment, the left engine fails. The plane lurches. The flight attendants know something is wrong. This is not just some sort of turbulence. The sound of the left engine can be heard winding down. 
The plane begins to descend. The passengers aren't quite sure what's going on, but there is a palpable fear starting to fill the cabin. The head flight attendant makes their way toward the cockpit. We lost the left engine, Pearson shouts just as the flight attendant opens the cockpit door. She stands there with a look of horror on her face but immediately falls back on her training. She closes the door and informs the rest of the cabin crew. All right, let's prepare for a single engine landing. We've been trained for just this kind of situation, Pearson says. Kintal nods his head and starts radioing the tower in Winnipeg that they've lost an engine and will be conducting an emergency landing. As Kintal is relaying his message, Pearson tries to restart the left engine. It sputters but won't start up again. A new siren begins to blare in the cockpit. The pilot's worst nightmare has come true. The siren signals that all the engines are out. Then there's a sharp bong that neither pilot has ever heard before, and everything goes dark. 8.06 p.m., two minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. The passengers now know something is wrong. The lights in the plane have gone completely out, and the sound of both engines has been reduced drastically. The 767 was one of the first airliners to run all of their electronics and flight instruments using the power generated by the engines. This wouldn't have been a problem if there was one engine still running, but that's no longer the case. Passengers begin to scream and children begin to cry. The flight attendants try to keep their cool as they tell everyone to fasten their seatbelts and remain calm. The plane jerks back and forth. It's falling from the sky. Liam looks around, trying to figure out what's happening. He unbuckles his seatbelt and stands up. Sophia grabs him and pulls him back to his seat. Buckle up! I think we're gonna crash, she whispers. Liam's eyes are wide. He's never been so scared in his life. He rebuckles his seatbelt and looks at Sophia. She holds out her hand. He takes it. She squeezes tight. Flight 143 descends to 35,000 feet or 10,700 meters. It's losing altitude fast. Pearson holds tightly onto the shaking yoke and tries to keep the plane level. Quintal has informed Winnipeg they lost both engines. He looks at Pearson. I don't remember this being covered in training, Quintal says. It's because it wasn't, shouts Pearson. This wasn't supposed to happen. Quintal grabs the emergency manual looking for the section that contains the checklist of things to do when both engines go out. He's disheartened to find that no such checklist exists. The pilots are operating in the dim glow cast by the few instruments that run on their own batteries. Everything else, including their screens, sensors, and warning lights, went off when the second engine failed. 8.07 p.m., three minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. I can't move the yoke, pedals, or any of the levers, Pearson yells. When the power went out, the hydraulic systems used to multiply the force of the pilots so they could operate the heavy machinery of the aircraft from the cockpit became disabled. Now, no matter what either pilot does, nothing will budge. For a moment, Pearson is filled with terror as he no longer has control of the plane. There's a loud clunk from the fuselage. When the power went out, an emergency ram air turbine swung out from a hidden compartment. This turbine drives a hydraulic pump that reinstates the power supply to the hydraulic system. The controls in the cockpit begin working again. 8.09 p.m., five minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. Flight 143 continues to descend toward the ground. All right, I can do this, Pearson says out loud. He thinks about his experiences as a glider pilot. Those crafts are much smaller and lighter than a 767, but he could use the same principles to hopefully bring this behemoth of a plane in for a landing. In order to give them the best shot of making it to Winnipeg, Pearson calculates the optimum gliding speed for a 100-ton passenger plane in his head. This has obviously never been done before, so he does the best with what he has. I'm going to try to slow us down to 220 knots, Pearson says to Kintal who's still using charts and maps to identify the best place to set the plane down. Kintal gives him a thumbs up and speaks into his headset. We're changing our speed to 220 knots, Winnipeg. Please be advised we're coming in hot without any engines or power. Kintal unbuckles and proceeds to the cabin full of frightened people. We have a fuel problem, he tells the head flight attendant. We're going to land in Winnipeg. Kintal turns around and rushes back into the cockpit. The flight attendant informs the passengers. Liam looks out the window and sees nothing but trees and natural features. They are nowhere near Winnipeg. His stomach sinks. Liam turns to Sophia. Her eyes are closed. He stares at her for a few seconds. When she opens one of her eyes, she squeezes his hand again. We're going to be okay, she says. Liam pauses for a moment. If we make it out of this alive, can I buy you a coffee, he asks. Sophia smiles. I would like that, she whispers. 8.11 p.m., seven minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. Kintal grabs Pearson's arm. I don't think we can make it to Winnipeg, he says. I've charted it three times, we just don't have the altitude. Kintal points to one of the mechanical backup instruments that's still working. He used the aircraft's radar echo from Winnipeg to determine the plane had lost 5,000 feet in 10 nautical miles. At that rate, they'd fall well short of reaching the Winnipeg airfield. I'm going to look for an alternative, Kintal shouts. Just keep this bird airborne for as long as possible. 
Pearson makes slight adjustments to give Quintal more time. He's flying by feel at this point as all the instruments to help guide the aircraft are either dead or useless without electricity. He cranes his neck to get a look at the landscape below. He can tell that their descent is faster than he hoped. All Pearson can do is keep the plane steady until Quintal finds an alternate landing site. 8.12 PM, 8 minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. A large group of people is camped out at Gimli Motorsports Park getting ready for the races in the coming days. This particular event is being hosted by Winnipeg Sports Car Club. Campers and RVs are set up along the tree line and pond. Hot dogs and burgers are being cooked on open fires. Kids run around playing tag while the adults relax in their chairs and sip on drinks. The festivities at the park are supposed to be one of the best of the year. Cars and drivers from across the region have converged at Gimli to compete or just watch the action. There's a road race course, a go-kart track, a drag strip. At the moment, none of the courses are being used as the events have ended for the day. Gimli's a perfect site for the event, as it used to be an airfield for the Royal Canadian Air Force. After it was decommissioned, the auto clubs took over. Little did anyone know that the airfield was about to become operational once again, and everyone who was there would be in grave danger. 8.14 PM, 10 minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. I think I've found a place to land, Kintal says to Pearson. There's an old decommissioned Air Force base I used to fly out of not too far from here called Gimli. It's within our flight path. Should be abandoned unless it's been repurposed for something else, but as far as I can tell from the map, we should be able to make it. Pearson adjusts his course slightly to line up with the airfield. Kintal relays his new plan to Winnipeg and tells them to send emergency services to Gimli. The air traffic controller confirms the request. No one at the Winnipeg control tower has any idea the airfield is being used for a motorsports event. 8.17 PM, 13 minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. Kintal runs his fingers over the different switches on the dashboard, looking for the correct one. He locates the lever to force a gravity drop of the landing gear. When the hydraulic system went out with the rest of the power, the pilots lost the ability to lower the landing gear. To remedy the situation, a gravity drop forces the locking mechanism to mechanically unclamp and the landing gear to free fall into position. Sophia hears a loud bang and the sound of rushing wind under the floorboards. She looks at Liam. I think that was the landing gear, she says. Liam looks out the window. The landscape is much closer than when he last checked. People all around him are either praying, yelling, or holding onto their armrests for dear life. It'll only be a matter of minutes before they are either safely on the ground or engulfed by a raging inferno as the plane is ripped apart on impact. The rear landing gear is down and locked, says Quintal, but we have a problem with the nose wheel. For some reason, it's not locked into place. There's no way for the pilots to fix it or try again without power, so they just hope for the best. Pearson shouts back to the flight attendants, prepare for an emergency landing. This message is relayed to the passengers and everyone holds on tight. 8.19 PM, 15 minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. Pearson can now see the runway they're aiming for. It looks like there's some activity in the area, but he hopes it's just emergency vehicles who are there to come to their aid. He glances outside the cockpit window to try to get a reading on their speed. It becomes clear that the plane is approaching the runway too fast, and if they don't slow down, they'll overshoot their target. Without hydraulics or power, there's no way to extend the flaps to slow their speed. Maybe we should fly a circle around the airfield to slow us down, Kintal suggests. Pearson shakes his head. The plane doesn't have enough altitude to complete the full maneuver. I'm going to try something I do when I'm gliding, Pearson says. He shifts the controls so that the rudder is going in one direction and the ailerons are pointed in the other direction. This is known as a side slip and causes the plane to increase drag while decreasing altitude at the same time. The controls tighten up as the air being forced through the ramjet decreases. Pearson has to put all his strength into straightening the plane back out in preparation for the landing. He grits his teeth and pulls hard. 8.20 PM, 16 minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. The campers at Gimli continue to play golf, ride bikes, and cook dinner, unaware that a passenger airliner is careening toward them. The sun is still above the horizon as the summer months receive a lot of light this far north. There's no way for anyone to know that the plane is approaching, as without working engines, the aircraft makes very little noise. Everyone at the decommissioned airfield continues to enjoy their evening as Flight 143 comes barreling toward them. Are those kids on bikes? Kintal asks, pointing ahead of them. The plane is only a thousand feet or 300 meters off the ground. Get out of the way, kids! Pearson yells, even though he knows there's no way they can hear him. He pulls back on the yoke and glances out the window. He sees the boys looking up at the plane with their mouths wide open. This is it! Pearson yells, there's no stopping now! 8.21 PM, 17 minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. People at the motorsports event scream as the 767 crashes into the ground and begins sliding toward them. People on the plane yell in terror as they're thrown against their seatbelts from the impact. Liam holds Sophia in his arms, 
hoping they can make it out of this alive. Pearson and Kintal slam on the brakes as soon as the wheels touch down. The plane skids along the decommissioned runway. The front landing gear gives and the nose of the plane slams into the ground, sending sparks and smoke flying out from the metal scraping against the concrete. A guardrail that was constructed to separate the two sides of the drag racing strip gets caught under the nose of the plane. The screeching of metal on metal fills the air. This additional friction helps to slow the plane down. Ahead of the nose, Pearson can see a large group of RVs and campers at the end of the runway. If they don't stop, this plane will slam into the group of people and vehicles, causing immense death and destruction. He grits his teeth harder and pulls back on the yoke. Flight 143 continues to skid along the runway, crashing through the barriers. The group of campers is getting closer and closer. Two of the plane's tires explode, causing the metal casings to scratch against the ground. The plane is almost at the end of the runway. The campers are only 1,300 feet away. 1,200 feet, 1,100 feet, 1,000 feet. Suddenly, the airplane comes to a stop. It rocks back and forth before settling. The nose has been crushed, and the landing gear is mangled. The smoking fuselage rests on the ground. Pearson opens his eyes. He doesn't move. Suddenly, he hears applause erupt from the main cabin behind him. The passengers are thanking the flight team and cheering the amazing flight skills of Captain Pearson and First Officer Kintal. They saved everyone's lives and managed to stop the plane before it hurt anyone at the motorsports festival. 8.23 p.m., 19 minutes after Flight 143 ran out of fuel. The emergency hatches and doors of the plane are opened. Since the front landing gear failed, the entire plane is on an incline with the tail high up in the air. The flight crew deploys the emergency chutes and the passengers are helped down. Sophia steps out of the hatch, jumps, and slides to safety. Liam is right behind her. When he reaches the bottom of the slide, Sophia is waiting for him with her arms outstretched. They embrace for a moment, then proceed to the side of the runway. The people camped around the decommissioned airfield race to the plane to provide any help they can. Emergency services are on their way. No one is pushing or shoving to get off the plane. The worst is over, and the passengers exit in an orderly manner. The last people off the aircraft are the flight attendants and the two pilots. As ambulances and fire trucks arrive on the scene, a few of the passengers with minor injuries are treated. Everyone else waits to be brought to Winnipeg, where they'll be put up for the night by Air Canada. Sophia and Liam stand hand in hand as fire crews spray the nose of the plane with water to cool the metal hull. She turns to Liam and looks him in the eyes. How about that coffee? She says. They both laugh. There were over 60 passengers and 8 crew members aboard Flight 143. Everyone survived, and there were no serious injuries. Captain Robert Pearson and First Officer Maurice Quintal were heroes. However, an investigation into what happened to the plane did uncover the mistakes made when calculating the amount of fuel necessary to make it to Edmonton. July 25, 1983, two days after Flight 143 ran out of fuel, the aircraft is repaired right on Gimli Airfield and flown from the decommissioned airbase to Winnipeg, where it underwent a rigorous set of repairs and maintenance work. In the coming months, the 767 will return to service and continue to fly Air Canada passengers until it's replaced by an updated model. After the investigation concludes, Captain Pearson is demoted for six months, and First Officer Quintal is put on a two-week suspension for their roles in the incident. Three maintenance workers who worked on the plane that day were also suspended. However, in 1985, both Pearson and Quintal were awarded the first-ever Fédération Aéronautique Internationale Diploma for outstanding airmanship. They had saved the lives of everyone on Flight 143, and their quick decision-making and admirable flying saved the plane itself. During the investigation, several attempts to replicate Pearson and Quintal's success in landing a 767 without any engines were carried out in simulations. Every single test resulted in the plane crashing. What Pearson and Quintal had done was nothing short of a miracle. Both men continued to pilot aircraft for the rest of their lives, expectedly always double-checking their fuel levels before takeoff. Now watch Malaysian Air Mystery, what we now know about missing flight MH370, or check out what happens when you break the sound barrier.